If you were to ask a random person on the street who Hayao Miyazaki was, chances are they wouldn't know. But if you were to ask a movie buff, anyone online, or pretty much any person from Japan, everyone would tell you that he is the animation champion of the world. Only in the past 10-15 years has he finally started to get credit in America, allowing our audiences to see tons and tons of his genius work. But it turns out, he's not the only one turning out Miyazaki material. His animation company, Studio Ghibli, has also been turning out timeless classic after timeless classic. Again, only starting to get recognition in America in the past 10-15 years. And who do we have to thank for all this imagination being shown to us? That's right, the Big D. Or more specifically, John Lasseter, who's friends with Hayao Miyazaki and promised to get as much of his work to our audiences as possible. The result was the majority of the studio's films being re-released and re-dubbed in America. But they didn't just half-ass it, they went out of their way to get the best talent possible. The best sound people, the best translators, and of course, the best actors. It only figures that Disney, another great leader in animation imagination, would be the people to introduce us to not only such wonderful artwork, but such fantastic stories. So, this disney December, every single day of the month I am going to be looking at one of the films from Miyazaki or Miyazaki Studio. The one catch is that it has to have been re-released by Disney and redubbed by them, because hey, it is disney December. Now there's only one problem with that. There's not enough films to fill out the entire month. So. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna go back to all the films that people requested but I never got around to. That's right, The Nightmare Before Christmases, The Dick Tracys. Hell, I'll even go over the ones I did a vlog of already, but people seem to want to see the Disney December version of it. And hey, some time has gone by, maybe some of the opinions have changed. So, every other day it's a Studio Ghibli film, and the other half of the days it's gonna be one of the Disney classics. But hell, even that's not enough. I want so much Disney down your throat that you'll swear we've been bought out by them or something. So, I'm gonna give in to peer pressure and also do a vlog series on one that I've been getting a lot of requests to do for a while. That's right, both my brother and I are gonna be doing a vlog series of Gravity Falls, right along with Disney December every single day of the month. It'll be the most ambitious Disney December yet. You'll be vomiting rainbows a week after watching them. There's a lot of imagination, a lot of great characters, a lot of great stories. Hell, there's just a lot of greatness to get through. So sit back, everybody. This is Disney December. The Studio Ghibli Overlook Classics and Gravity Falls Edition. Let's start with a film that wasn't technically Studio Ghibli when it came out, but they still marketed it under the name and Disney picked it up anyway, so I think it counts. Nausicaa and the Valley of the Wind, a film surely not to be ignored. This was only director Miyazaki's second film and already it was a gigantic epic. The story centers around a princess, yeah, get used to seeing those. I think Ghibli might be the only studio that actually uses princesses more than Disney. Who lives in an apocalyptic future. Actually, one of the nicer apocalyptic futures. Very green, lots of mountains, nice scenery. Well, at least in this part of the world. Other parts of the world, there's nothing but war a brewing. Everyone's attacking everyone, trying to find old monsters and creatures to destroy one another. When those warring countries find the Valley of the Wind, they see an opportunity to use their land and their resources to their advantage. Nausicaa, after discovering the death of her father, peacefully tries to find a way to save everybody and not cause any more bloodshed. Along the way he comes across a boy who's on the other side and asks her to join his quest. But she doesn't want to be on anyone's side, she just wants war to leave and no more people to die. No more people or bugs. Yes, in this futuristic world, there's also giant monsters that look like bugs. Hell, even the planes kind of look like bugs. Which is kind of cool when you think about it. You assume all birds are gone in this world, so their planes wouldn't really look like birds like ours. Instead, they would look like insects. Kind of a neat note. But nevertheless, Nausicaa doesn't want anything living to perish. So she goes back and forth between every single side imaginable, trying to find the peaceful route. For only a second film, it's one hell of an ambitious project. It tries to throw so much at you, and for the most part, it pays off pretty well. You very easily understand the conflict of every single character. And every single character does have a conflict. It's a lot of fun just seeing them work off each other, trying to figure out strategies, what to do next. Everything is always in a huge rush. Something like that can usually be a little too busy and distracting, but the characters are strong enough to pull it through. At first I thought it was kind of weird that Nausicaa would flip-flop back and forth between sort of this crying, sad, emotional person to this sudden, sword-wheeling badass that always seems to have a plan. But when you see what it's all building up to in the end, yeah, actually it does kind of make sense. It's kind of like a peaceful person who knows how to fight but never really wants to fight because she doesn't want to see anyone hurt. So when she does have to do it, or her rage gets the best of her, she feels an incredible amount of guilt. 
With that said, I love the fact that she always has a plan. I mean, always. Our ship is going down? You go this way, I'll go that way, I'll jump up here and do this thing. Kingdom being overthrown? I'll go this way, you go this way. We'll rendezvous after we do the huge, big, gigantic thing. She isn't just kicking a little bit of ass and that's it. She always has a strategy, and she comes up with them so fast. She's a lot of fun to watch. She also has a real good supporting cast. Voice actors like Patrick Stewart and Shia LaBeouf really add a lot of credibility. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. Shia LaBeouf at credibility? Well, yeah, say what you will about his personal life in the Transformer movies, but I don't think he's that bad an actor. And I think he finds just the right mix in this role. Angry and vengeful, but still looking for the right thing to do. If I did have a problem with this film, though, I would actually say that, as good as the characters are, I could have used just a little bit more of them. That is to say, if a story like this really wanted to have the biggest impact, it probably should have been two movies. I mean it when I say they throw a lot at you, and it is constantly on the move. That's not to say they don't have their slower moments to just be characters. They do, and they're done well. But for the giant climax this film is trying to build up at the end, I felt I really want to know these people a touch more. For example, the villain, played by Uma Thurman, and her second-in-command seem to have this kind of playful banter where they almost hope the other would die, but they also kind of respect the strategy of the other. A part of me really wanted to know more about that. But it's a big anime at Epic and you can only fit into two hours, so a lot of that stuff has to be cut. And I'm sure there was more stuff. This is based on a manga. I get the feeling they went into even more detail about these people. It's not that the film needs to be longer. It already feels like a decent length. I just felt like I really wanted to be on these characters' side more than what I was. Which is to say, I didn't want to see them perish, but I didn't feel the entire weight of the film the way I think it wanted me to feel. Maybe one or two less scenes of traveling and shouting orders replaced with a little bit more of natural talking would have done it. But that really is a bit of a nitpick. It's still very large in scale and very impressive to look at. And I want to know what it's all going to amount to. Have they been able to explore a little bit more? I think this could have been on par with, say, the Lord of the Rings movies. But as is, it's still pretty damn impressive. It's so cool seeing where all of these Miyazaki tropes start. The technology, the monsters, the love of nature. His thumbprint is all over it. And it's even more impressive when you think no computers were used on it either. I mean, look at this. This looks like something that could be animated today. Great backgrounds, great environment, great atmosphere, great characters, great story. What else can you say? Nausicaa in the Valley of the Wind is just great. Go take a rent and see for yourself. The Black Hole is one of those movies I always heard a lot of people talk about, but not usually very favorably. And after having finally seen it, I can definitely see why. It's Disney's attempt at trying to be every popular sci-fi film that's ever come out. In fact, you can point practically scene by scene what movie they're trying to replicate. First it's Alien, then it's Battlestar Galactica, then it's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, then it's Star Wars, and then finally it's 2001 A Space Odyssey. In trying to combine them all together, you get a film that has very little identity and is just kind of a huge mess. But at the same time, I can't say it was entirely bad. There are some good things about it. A couple. Maybe. It starts off with an expedition in space where they come across a craft that apparently has been lost for years. A scientist and his robot standing on the edge of the black hole. He claims the rest of the crew died. Yeah, that's it. And that he's been spending his time trying to figure out how he can go through the black hole and come out the other end. He thinks he's finally found a way, and everybody is intrigued to see if he can actually do it. The downside is there's a lot of mysterious things going on. His robot crew almost seems a little too human, and there's just this all-around threatening tone where the people feel more like prisoners than they do guests. Secrets are discovered, sides are declared, and it's a battle to see who can get off the ship alive. The best part about the movie, strangely enough, is its atmosphere. And don't get me wrong, a lot of the effects are not very good. They're supposed to be flying around in space, but it just kind of looks like they're standing around. And the king is really, really bad. I mean, look at that. Can you take a guess where the real film is and where the map painting begins? Yeah, it's pretty painful. But it almost makes up for it with this gigantic feeling of dread throughout the first half. Everybody knows something sneaky is going on, but they can't quite put their finger on what it is. They're just waiting for a trigger moment to whip out their guns and start defending themselves, but there never really seems to be a reason to. Plus, it has maybe one of the scariest robots of all time. Maximilian, 
Yeah, doesn't sound very scary, but whenever he's on screen, all the music stops, all the sound goes dead, and you just feel this thing's presence. He even gets in a few decent kills every once in a while. Look at this scene. Jesus Christ, for Disney, that's pretty gruesome. For such a simple design, I love how uncomfortable I feel whenever he's on screen. He doesn't even say anything, it's just, I don't know, it's just this presence they create. Aside from that, the evil scientist is pretty good, Ernest Borgnine adds a little bit of comedy, but all the other actors are under this really weird, stoic way of acting, and it just comes across as so wooden. Even great actors like Rowdy McDowell and Anthony Perkins. You can sense they're trying to get a good performance out of this, but there's just so little to work with. There's a lot of elements they throw in that don't really seem to go anywhere either. For example, this woman's telepathic. It's useless. There's totally no point to it at all. She communicates with the robot at some point, but what, they don't have communicators? Walkie-talkies, cell phones, none of that is created in the future? The ending itself is just a huge clusterfuck. It mixes in images of heaven and hell and yeah, I don't know why, I don't know what it's trying to say, but it's not quite like 2001 where the vagueness is part of the intrigue. It's more like we're obviously trying to say something, you just can't figure out what it is. And based on the rest of the film, you can tell that whatever it had to say probably wasn't that intelligent or interesting. Look at this, this incredibly fake asteroid feel is going by and one even crashes into the ship. Why the hell is it going that slowly? They're whizzing by at incredible speeds before, and now it's given time for the characters to cross a bridge right in front of it? It's like a school crossing, it just looks ridiculous. But I do give credit to the film that it was at least trying to be a little smarter than your average sci-fi film. Yeah, Star Wars in 2001 were big hits and everybody was trying to copy them, and so is this film. But a lot of it's very dialogue focused. Not much action, not much running around. I guess I kind of like the fact that it at least made an attempt to be smarter. It just didn't seem to pay off. So yeah, I guess like what a lot of people say, it's not a very good film. Even by the so bad it's good standards, it's still not very good. But I am glad I saw a few of those scenes that created some pretty decent atmosphere. Even if it was really fake looking. Definitely not one of Disney's best, and you can probably just give it a pass. The awesomeness of Castle in the Sky can be summed up right in the very opening. Ships are soaring through the air, a young girl falls out, a boy discovers her, and suddenly a glowing crystal causes her to slowly but surely float down to the ground while enchanting music is played. Yep, that's the movie in a nutshell. And I mean that in a very positive way. Castle in the Sky has all the ambitious adventure of a kid's film that you remember watching in the 80s. The ones that had a touch of an edge, but mostly a very timeless, endearing feel to them. The ones like Return to Oz or Labyrinth. The ones that still seem to hold up after so many years. Well, for the most part. There's no David Bowie cod piece in this. Though maybe the head of that robot could... Anyway, the film starts off exactly like I said, a girl falling to the ground and a boy discovers her. The boy's name is Pazu and the girl's name is Sheeta, voiced by Anna Paquin and James Vanderbeek. He nurses her back to health as she admits that she's being chased by some evildoers. The kind that know that she is the key to some sort of mystical something or other. Again, very 80s fantasy. Quite coincidentally, Pazu has been looking for that something or other. A floating city known as Laputa. Some believe it's been destroyed, others say it never existed, but of course, our young heroes are destined to discover it. Along the way, they come across some treacherous air pirates, with their leader voiced by Cloris Leachman, who in my opinion can do no wrong. She once again plays up both the comedy and the awesomeness of this character, being both goofy and badass at the same time. The villains chasing them are led by Mark Hamill, who, if you know his voice over work, once again gives a deviously delicious performance, dragging out his lines and constantly making you question does he have a British accent or not. Once again, not only does the artwork in this movie show a lot of patience and a lot of passion, but the creativity is just wonderful. I feel like I'm watching an extended version of the timeless Disney afternoon shows, kind of like DuckTales meets Tailspin. Duck, Tales, Spin, with people. But whatever you call it, it's a ton of fun. The dubbing is once again very well done, with the main characters' voices displaying the wide-eyed whimsy, and the side characters being goofy and memorable. For whatever reason, I especially like the lighting in this film too, particularly the day versus night. I'm always a sucker for night shots that have that warm glow from a building. And something about Miyazaki's skies are always just so blue, you can get lost in them somehow. 
I don't know what color he's choosing or what palette he has, but they're always just incredible. You want to fly through these skies every time you see them. If I had to nitpick anything wrong, I guess I could say that maybe James Vanderbeek sounds a touch too old to be playing this part, but then again, you can't quite figure out the boy's age, maybe just his voice is changing. Everything else in this movie is classic Miyazaki. A lot of focus on the technicals and how they work. A lot of using machinery, but also this very high respect for plant life. There's something so cool about seeing those rustic robots and yet having green grow on them. In a strange way, I think that almost sums up Miyazaki's work. A perfect combination of advanced technology that's also kind of old, kind of new, but always has a good mix of nature in there too. The pirates especially are just so likable. I don't know what it is about them, they're just so much energy and they're so goofy and they have such an awesome leader. It's pretty hard not to wish you could be a part of this group. It has a lot of the pretty imagery, a lot of the nice colors, and a lot of the imagination that you usually associate with his work. It's hard to know what else to say about it. I mean, I don't know if it's gonna be breaking any big barriers necessarily, at least none that I know of, but as these general fantasies go, ones that mix technology with great characters, and a gripping story with lots of nature, and excitement, and romance, and just all that good stuff that you've grown to love, this one mixes them up pretty good. Take flight and discover for yourself. So a lot of people have been requesting something wicked this way comes, which is interesting because when the film came out, it was a major bomb. It didn't even make half of its money back. And truth be told, I never even heard of it until I was like maybe in the ninth grade. I remember as being shown in my school as an understanding of Ray Bradbury's work and all the kids were so excited. Something wicked this way comes, oh I love that movie! I was kind of wondering how I missed it as I thought I saw all the really dark 80s kids films that came out around that time. I say this to point out that this is not a film I grew up with, so I'm not really gonna let the nostalgia factor get in the way. But that doesn't necessarily make it a bad film, I just don't think I love it like everybody else loves it. The movie centers around two boys, one named Will Holloway and the other named, get this, Jim Nightshade. God, how does Bradbury find these incredible names? They're often seen around Will's father, who's an old librarian, and they spend most of their time just getting into trouble, all sorts of typical boy stuff. But then one night, a carnival arrives. I mean literally one night. It's all put together in a matter of just a few minutes. And this has been put together by Dr. Dark, played by Jonathan Price. He welcomes people to the carnival, but the boys figure out that slowly but surely it seems to be sucking away people's souls, apparently draining their life force and messing with their actual age. Of course, nobody believes the boys' story, so it's up to them to figure out how to stop this evil monster. I get the feeling even if I saw this as a little kid, I wouldn't find it very scary, but it is pretty creative. The atmosphere and characters especially make up for the fact that the story itself is not phenomenally interesting, or at least kinda slow moving. They kind of go through the typical run-of-the-mill stuff of people not believing them, trying to convince those that will believe them, foiling the charismatic, diabolical villain, all that good stuff. It's not a film that screams exciting or super creepy. It's more of a laid-back kind of elegant film. It's hard to explain. It's like the creepy stuff doesn't come out at you and say boo. It's more building up this environment that slowly is trying to get you without you necessarily even knowing it. And at the foreground of that is Jonathan Price, who is just perfect as the villain. He never goes quite too over the top, but at the same time, he's just so graceful and loving of what he does. Just look at that outfit. You can tell he wears that suit with such incredible charisma. But at the same time, he's never too charming that he's not scary. A kid can still look at him and know he's the bad guy. I really like Will's father in this too. You just get the feeling he's trying to make ends meet, be a good person, just do what needs to be done. But at the same time, life is starting to wear on him and he just doesn't know what to believe in anymore. This of course is a great contrast for the kids who see all sorts of fantastic things, but have a hard time making the adult of the world realize it. A part of me does wish it would go a little further with its creepy imagery and disturbing thoughts. Why not get a few more monsters or go a little bit edgier? I think that's why people still talk about films like Return to Oz and Sleepy Hollow and so forth, because they did take risks. And while this one certainly has a lot of atmosphere, it doesn't really try anything that different. Okay, I don't need Monster Squad style violence, but just something to make it stand out a little bit more. But then again, maybe you could argue that's a part of its charm. It's not an in-your-face movie, it's not a very obvious monster film. 
The journey and the build-up and the suspense maybe is what the star is supposed to be. It is a kid's film after all, and after hearing all the people that talk about and remember it, I guess it did leave a bigger impact than I imagined it probably would. It's a good film, I just don't think it's great. I think I get more sucked into the foggy shadows than I do the actual characters or story. But they still suck me in enough to want to know what's going to happen in the end. If you're looking for one of those classic, intense 80s kids films that are super dark and super shocking, this probably isn't it for you. But if you're looking for something to just put on that has a lot of atmosphere and a bit of a creepy vibe, this might be more up your alley. Think something like Are You Afraid of the Dark, except a little smarter and more elegant. Check it out next Halloween and see for yourself. Whenever there's a discussion about the most powerful animated films, like no fairy tales, no magic, just pure, raw, adult emotion, Grave of the Fireflies is usually brought up. A lot of people consider it a good segue who see animation as just kid stuff, something that can't be taken seriously by adults. So when I heard that, I got really excited and I sort of got this idea of what it was going to be like and what it was going to be about. I saw this film around the same time I saw Saving Private Ryan on the big screen, and I had an idea what it was gonna be. Oh, war is bad, people throwing up their hands saying why, oh, the no good of violence, and so on and so forth. But what I got was something very, very different. I knew it was gonna be more focused on the family end, but not quite in the way they depicted it. I don't even see it as really a war movie. I see it more as a battle between pride and sanity between love and self-preservation. So it kind of confused me when I was younger because I kept thinking I was going to see some sort of anti-war film and I felt that's not really what I got. I didn't dislike it, I knew it was good, I just didn't quite know what to clarify it as, what to accept it as. Now that I'm older, that's one of the things I like the most about it. It doesn't seem anti-war or pro-war, it's just a boy and his sister trying to figure out what's the most important. You know the film's going to be grim when you see the death of our main character being reunited with the spirit of his younger sister. Well, we know this doesn't end happily. We can only go up from here. The two have a flashback as they roam the spirit world of how they got to where they are. The boy's name is Sieta, and the girl is Sesuko. They're in the final days of World War II, but you wouldn't know it with all the bombings that are still going on. Their father is in the war, and their mother is suddenly killed from one of the bombings. The two decide to go live with a distant aunt, but she starts to get a little on their nerves, claiming they aren't working hard enough for the food that she's preparing, and having a pretty understandable breakdown every once in a while for the situation that she's been put in. Unsatisfied with the living situation, Sieta decides to take his sister and live on their own, believing he's totally capable of doing so. Trying to claim his independence, slowly but surely he discovers that they can't survive on their own. But he's too proud and too determined to see the truth and lives in a horrible state of denial. Thinking that if he tries harder and sticks to his independence, they can come out of this okay. But reality starts to set in and options start to become fewer and fewer. Always thinking salvation is just a day away, he continues to try his best living on his own while his world crumbles. The artistic style in this movie is not trying to be so much pretty or showing off as much as trying to be more realistic. They still move like anime characters, but it's not trying to do any big kicks or flips or any weird angles. Most of the shots keep very still and just let the emotion of the animation carry it through. As well as the voice acting, which is dubbed over pretty well. I personally grew up with a subtitle version and prefer that one a bit more, but the dub is still very well done. There's a lot of different ways you can look at this movie. On the one hand, you can see the boy as a terrible character. Not only is he letting himself starve to death, but he's letting his sister starve to death as well. But I think because they choose to do this age, it makes us suddenly understand what he's trying to accomplish. I think a lot of growing people at that age can become incredibly delusional. And that may be part of the focus of the story, is not to try and grow up too fast, and to appreciate what you have and who you have while you still have them. While many people see it as an anti-war film, and I suppose you can see it as that way, my thought is that this can take place over any disaster. It could happen after a tornado, a tsunami, an earthquake, or yes, even a war. The focus is on the boy who doesn't realize how far he's being pushed, and that there's no crime in accepting failure or asking for help. Part of what makes it work is that the boy himself is not a mean character. A lot of people that have a lot of pride, they usually just throw into the jerk category. Oh, there's nothing good about them, they're just too full of themselves and think they can do stuff that's totally delusional. But this kid's a likable kid. 
His dad is a fighter and he wants to do the same thing, he wants to be the big supporter. A lot of young people were under that delusion during World War II. If you're failing, it just means you're not trying hard enough. Fight harder, fight harder. I think there's this sense of losing one's honor if you accept defeat. Which is fitting as we see Sieda witness the surrender of Japan. And he's furious by it. He doesn't care that the war is over, he's just torn apart that they actually lost. It's a film that takes an angle that many films like this don't take. Not the family element, there's a lot of movies that do that. But the coming of age element of knowing when to declare your independence and when not to. And that the consequences can be greater than you ever could have imagined. For someone who was expecting more of the Saving Private Ryan route where there was going to be a lot of dead bodies and a lot of gore and a lot of obvious symbolism, I was really blown away that the emotionally gripping and tormenting parts of this movie are the simple choices that they make. And how easily things could have been fixed if he just swallowed his pride. As a young man watching this, I don't know if I was really ready to accept that. Or at least, I didn't know how to accept it. Maybe in that way it was more ahead of its time an adult than I thought. You have to have a real understanding of what misguided pride can do, and what the non-acceptance of failure can be capable of. The honorable route is not always the winning route. And that's a tough thing not just for people growing up to learn, but for straight up grown-ups to learn. It gets a little better and a little more heartbreaking every single time I see it. And maybe that's because I feel like I understand it a bit more every time I see it. But again, one of the great things is you could look at it a totally different way. Maybe it's about respecting your elders. Maybe there is no right or wrong. Maybe it's all about the war. Maybe it's all about the consequences of war. Anyone can look at it and draw their own conclusion. What is concrete about the film is that you look at these two characters and want them to make it through. Even though you're told at the very beginning that they're not going to make it through. This makes it all the more heartbreaking as you watch. Whatever age you are, it's an important film to check out. It's unlike any other film of its kind, and deserves all the praise that it gets. Growing up in the 80s and 90s, we had a lot of various specials that always acted like they were gonna scare us. We had Tales from the Crypt, Are You Afraid of the Dark, Goosebumps, all sorts of various shows that kept explaining how they were gonna scare the crap out of us. And don't get me wrong, I like these shows, I think they're really creative, but there's always one problem to me. They were never scary! Even when I was a kid, I was saying to myself, where's the scary stuff? Where's the stuff that's gonna fuel my nightmares? Where's the stuff that's gonna keep me up? Watcher in the Woods is that movie. Yes, it's Disney, and yes, it's technically family-friendly, but it works like any great scary horror film. A lot of atmosphere, a lot of build-up, a lot of mystery, a lot of great shots, and a lot of creepy as well as clever imagery. The story is a family is looking in Britain for a new house to move into. They of course find a big, creepy place that of course has this terrible backstory, an uncomfortable landlord, and all sorts of supernatural things happening around it. Both the daughters in the family seem to have strange things happening to them. The youngest is almost being taken over like a puppet, and the older has a tendency to feel the presence of people that were once there before, or just feel all sorts of uncomfortable things. Slowly but surely, the truth about the disappearance of a certain girl named Karen comes to light, and the daughters are trying to figure out if it's the ghost of Karen that's trying to get in contact with them, or something else. What I like about this film is that there's very few things that actually separate it from a kid scary film and a regular scary film. In fact, I think this film has a lot more atmosphere and scares than most scary films. The only difference is there's no gore, murdering, or swear words in it. As well as the pacing is a little quicker than that of a usual scary movie, but again, they want to keep the kids attention. But apart from that, they treat it pretty adult. Notice how many quiet moments are in this. Yeah, remember that? You could have family films that had quiet moments. There didn't always need to be a ton of music or talking. This is called establishing mood, and it's done great here. The shots are also great. I absolutely love how they make these woods both beautiful and creepy at the same time. The cinematography surprisingly kind of has an Evil Dead feel to it. Obviously not as over the top, but just as clever with its setups. My favorite shot is right in the opening. It's just a car pulling into the place. Well, that's no biggie. Oh, well, that shot was kind of sloppily done. Wait a minute, why are we still rolling? Oh my god, this is a point of view shot! What's watching them? What's going on? Okay, it's not a big scare, but at the same time, it kind of catches you off your guard. It's setting up something you didn't know was being set up, and that's what a good scary film should do. The funny thing too is that there's a lot of point of view shots in this film, but just when you're about to get sick of them, they do something new with it. 
For example, here's a shot of her just going through the woods. Yeah, yeah, something's watching her, we've seen that a million times. But then at some point she goes inside and... Wait a minute, it's still out there. Why would they show this shot if something wasn't gonna happen? And it does, and it was properly built up and properly delivered. And just when you think a shot like that can't make you uncomfortable again, there's another scene where she's being followed. Well, okay, again, we've seen that a million times. But wait a minute, now it's inside? We didn't know it could go inside. Every time we've seen it, it's always been outside. Every time they do something with a point of view shot, they add something new to put you in a new state of uncomfortableness. It doesn't downplay anything because it's also gonna be shown to kids. No, it wants to scare the kids because that's why you're seeing a scary movie. I always hate it when those other shows had to clean it up and not make it too creepy. This goes all out there and tries to scare you without actually psychologically harming you. Kids can be drawn in to smart things, and scary films can be smart. The only downside I have of this film is that the acting from the main character is not very good. It's really hokey and awkward, and kind of reminds me of the girlfriend from Airplane. But I did see something in the mist at the pond. That's why I fell in. But even then, I don't mind too much because the whole film has such a strange feel to it that even the acting and its weirdness actually kind of blends in. The whole film's style is so uniquely its own that you kind of get used to it, and maybe it kind of adds to the weird feeling that you have throughout the entire movie. I don't want to give away too much, as part of the fun is being scared and surprised by it, but I will say, it's very well done. I kind of don't know why more people aren't talking about it. I mean, it's a legit scary film from Disney. How often does that happen? I mean, we got scary moments from other films that scare us because we're kids, and yeah, some of them go really far, but this is actually intending throughout the majority of the film to scare you, and it's actually effective. Are scary movie fans just put off that the Disney logo is in front of it? Are Disney fans put off that it's a little too dark and not as obvious for kids? I don't know, but it definitely deserves a lot more attention. Okay, I don't think it's gonna send anyone out running and screaming, but at the same time, it just creates this mood and this environment that just feels strange and dark and creepy and, I don't know, personally, I just love it. I wish more scary films aimed at kids tried this hard. I don't know if it's a censorship issue or if people are just too afraid to push the limit, but there's gotta be more movies like this. I can tell you for certain I found a new film to watch every Halloween. The atmosphere, the environment, the story, the characters, the scares. I'm just in love with this film. It's definitely worth checking out with the lights off when you're all alone and you feel like somebody's watching you. It's the iconic My Neighbor Totoro, a character so famous that he's actually the icon for Studio Ghibli. A big hit in Japan and even growing a cult following in America. The hype and good talk around this movie is so big that a lot of people actually end up kind of not liking it. And I can see why. It's built up so much and this image is so popular that anyone going in thinking they're gonna see this spectacular big story is probably gonna be really disappointed. Luckily, when I went in, I had no expectations whatsoever. I just got it from a friend saying, hey, this is a good movie, check it out. I did, and that's pretty much what I thought too. It was a good movie. Not great, but I don't think it's supposed to be great. I think it's supposed to be just a fun little flick. Why there's such an explosion over it, I don't know. Maybe people just like the sort of smaller flicks and want to get it more attention to a point where it's actually exploded into this giant franchise, kind of like how A Christmas Story has. But for what it is, I like it fine. The story's about a family that moves into a new home. There's a father, a mother, and two little daughters, played by the Fanning sisters. But they discover something very interesting about this home. Apparently there's spirits all over the place. In any other movie, this would probably be a scary thing, but the family just kind of accepts it and says hi. Sometimes the spirits say hi back, but most of the time they just keep in hiding. And wouldn't you know it, one of them is a giant koala cat thing known as Totoro. He doesn't exactly do much, he just kind of sleeps, takes the bus, he can fly, that's kind of cool. And he has absolutely no dialogue outside of one or two roars. And that's about it. Really, that's the movie. It's just sort of watching these girls interact with the spirit and them getting used to moving to a new location. And for whatever reason, it kind of works. And don't get me wrong, there's still some incredible imagery in this. The backgrounds are wonderful. There's this cat bus thing that's now become world famous. 
and a lot of the flying scenes are very nice. But if you were to ask me what happens scene by scene, like in order of the story, I couldn't tell you. That is to say, stuff does happen, you see them trying to get used to being in this place and interacting with boys and so on and so forth, but the story's not really the focus. The focus is more character and atmosphere. The casting of the Fanning sisters was a very clever call, as they work very naturally off each other. They don't act like co-actors or even just friends, they feel like sisters. Something about that camaraderie and the way they work off each other, it's pretty solid. The rest of the voice acting is pretty good too. Though not a ton is required of it, it's still pretty effective. It's kind of like spending a really laid-back Sunday outside with some friends, maybe coming across a weird animal or trying to interact with it, playing around, getting dirty, coming home, and going to sleep. That's kind of the movie. But again, that's kind of childhood too, isn't it? Kind of those fun summer days where you could just sort of do whatever you want, you're out of school, and I don't know, that's how I see this movie. It's just kind of a really fun yet laid-back summer when you're a little kid. There's fun music and goofiness, but there's also a lot of quiet moments of just a character looking at another character or just taking the other in. And there's something actually really charming about it. I don't know, maybe that's kind of the strange fascination with the film, that absolutely nothing can happen on screen and yet you're still kind of sucked into it. There's a whole scene where one of the sisters just sits on top of Totoro, and that's it. There's another scene where the other sister just waits for a bus with Totoro, and that's it. Yet something about the way it's paced and animated and delivered, it feels very alive somehow. You don't feel like you're being manipulated or that this is lazy. You look like you're watching something kind of cool. Not spectacular, but kind of cool. And the film allows you to take in that small bit of wonder. While it's not big, it still allows you to take in the full amount. You soak in the scene. You remember the feelings. You remember the expressions. If stuff like that doesn't do it for you and you're looking for something that's a lot more story-based, then you're probably not going to have a good time with this. Granted, there is a dilemma in the last third of the film, but it almost feels a little forced and in some ways not needed. Like, the film just needed some kind of climax. But it's nowhere near so contrived that it ruins anything. You still want to see everything turn out okay and stick with these characters. But yeah, don't expect a lot of action or a lot of wonder or a lot of story, but just expect a small amount to be satisfied. I think that's part of the charm of Miyazaki's films. You have this art form of animation, anything you can draw can suddenly exist, and yet they use it to tell the story of only a few fantastical things and focus more on the human characters. Something about keeping it so minimal actually makes you appreciate what's on screen even more. At least from my point of view. I don't know, I haven't heard there's like any kind of backlash for this film, but I've definitely heard of people that watched it and just didn't get what it was all about, and I can understand that. There is so much build up for this movie, the image is shown all over the place, hell it's even in Toy Story! If you're looking for more of a relaxed film that you can pop in and just sort of enjoy the atmosphere of, you'll find it to be pretty charming, pretty creative, and just the right amount of entertaining. I personally don't see it as one of my favorites, I don't even know if I put it in one of Miyazaki's top 5, but it's still good, and there's a lot of effort that's put into it. It's small, it's simple, but who says there's anything wrong with that? I have never seen a film that looks like Dick Tracy. And I know a lot of people say that, oh, this imagery isn't like anything you've ever seen, blah, 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 but it's really true. I can't think of any other movie that looks like this. This might be the most ambitiously visual spectacle I've seen in years. It's crazy. The colors, the designs, the costumes, the makeup, it's totally insane. Which is why it really sucks that I can't remember a single friggin' thing about it. Is it that the visuals were so good it distracted from the rest of the story? Or is it that the story wasn't really that hot to begin with? Dick Tracy, based on the famous newspaper comic strip, is the yellow trench coat wearing cop played by Warren Beatty who's trying to take down the massive crime in his fair city. His arch nemesis, Big Boy, played by Al Pacino, is the yelling and screaming mob gangster who constantly wants to put him out of his way. He comes across a kid simply named Kid, a singer named Breathless Mahoney, played by Madonna, and all sorts of weird and literally colorful characters that constantly want to kill him. 
There's Flat Top, Baby Face, The Blank. They only get crazier and crazier. Okay, so the basic story is good guy versus bad guy, has cute kid sidekick, has a femme fatale, all the classic stuff you usually see in a lot of film noirs and so on. That part is easy to follow. What's not easy to follow is the steps they're taking to create this formula. There's a lot of talk of business, a lot of talk of fraud, a lot of talk of strategy, a lot of talk of planning, a lot of talk of breaking in, busting a person, and yeah, we see it happen, but... What do we really know about these people? Aside from Al Pacino, who's really yucking it up as the bad guy, there's nothing memorable about these characters. Warren Beatty is a tough cop, and that's about it. Madonna is the hot singer, and that's about it. The wisecracking kid's a wisecracking kid, and that's about it. You get where I'm going with this? Hearing them talk is not very riveting, and it's constantly being distracted by how incredible the backgrounds are. When the action finally does start, it looks pretty cool, but what do I care if any of these people get axed off? A part of me kind of respects that they're trying to take such a cartoonally silly looking film so seriously, but on the other hand, I just wish it could have been more interesting. I remember in the credits it said that Dick Van Dyke was in this movie. Dick Van Dyke? Where the hell was he? Oh, there he is. God, I didn't even notice him. He's in and out of the film so fast that he's barely even worth the credit. If Dick Van Dyke, Dick Van Freakin' Dyke can't leave an impact on you in a movie, you know there's gotta be something wrong with it. On top of that, there's a lot of scenes in the movie that are just downright gruesome, especially for a Disney film. Early on, they take this one gangster down by tying him up, putting him in a box, covering him in wet cement, and then throwing him in the river. All while he's crying and sobbing the whole time. That's pretty fucking intense. Don't get me wrong, I like a little dark and gritty in Disney films, but that's like something right out of a nightmare. I guess to the film's credit, it's not that it's really bad or annoying, it's just kind of dull. Like I said, I can barely remember what actually happened in this movie. I just remember it looked beautiful while it was happening. With that said, yeah, it is friggin' unbelievable to look at. I mean, who would dress this way? Who would design their buildings this way? Who would choose these colors? Who would have faces this bizarrely weird? Nobody would! It's obviously taking the idea of adapting the comic strip, which was very bright, colorful, and over the top, to a whole new level. It's definitely in its own unique world, one where the backgrounds don't even have to look that convincing. I mean, look at this. This is so obviously a matte painting. They're not even trying to hide the brush strokes. But that's just part of the style. It all looks phony, but in the same way that a puppeteer holding a puppet you know is phony, but you don't care. It's just so well done that you enjoy every second of it. So I'm kind of torn on the movie. On the one hand, I'm glad I saw it, if for any other reason, just to see it. But on the other hand, yeah, why couldn't they make the story more interesting? Why couldn't they flesh out the characters more? Why couldn't they be a lot more fun? Like I said, Pacino's great, but everyone else is just so phoned in and standard. Just because they look distinct doesn't mean they act distinct. I remember the makeup and the layout much more than I remember anything else in this film. And that's really a shame. If this did have a memorable story and characters, maybe it could be like one of the great film noirs. A film that plays to incredibly heavy shadows, but also somehow incredibly heavy colors. It could have been sort of this one-of-a-kind masterpiece. But as is, it's really just a style over substance movie. If you want to see the style and you just enjoy watching people in trench coats and fedora hats punch each other and shoot, then you'll at least be glad that you saw it. But if none of that does it for you, then I'm sad to say this is a very unfortunate skip. Everybody's gonna have a film that just connects with them for some reason they can't entirely explain. For many, that movie was My Neighbor Totoro. For me, it's Kiki's Delivery Service. In a sense, they're very similar. Not a lot of story, not a lot of action, just sort of a laid-back setup with a touch of the supernatural. But for some reason, this really grabbed me and hooked me a lot more than My Neighbor Totoro did. And that's especially impressive when you're given the age that I saw it. I was a junior in high school when I first saw this, and I didn't want to see any of this prissy stuff. What, a little witch with a big bow flying around, not casting spells, but instead delivering bread to people? Ah, oh, come on. Give her a machine gun or something. I'm a stupid high schooler. That's what I want to see. But even with that prejudice going in, I saw this on TV and surprisingly kept watching it. 
Even for as cutesy and simple as it was, something about it just really drew me into it. To a point where at the end, I found myself really loving it. The story centers around Kiki, of course, played by Kirsten Dunst. She's excited because she's at the age where witches can set off on their own and try to find their own identity. They leave the family, find a place to live, and try to see if they can work in the real world. She flies to a town far away where she eventually gets a job as a delivery girl. Accompanied by her snarky cat, voiced by Bill Hartman, the movie just follows her around as she does sort of typical girly things. Make deliveries, chat it up with friends, talk about boys, all that good stuff. And once again, that's kind of all there is to it, just watching the simple life of this little witch. I really love how Miyazaki's worlds are just so accepting of these fantastic supernatural elements. They just live in a world where witches are normal. Okay, whatever, there's a witch flying around. Hi, how you doing? But at the same time, they still ask her questions and want to know things about her. It gives a very clear understanding of how they're accepted in this world. Kirsten Dunst is absolutely perfect as Kiki. It never feels forced, it never feels like she's playing the role too young or too old. It seems like the perfect age. All the side actors are great too. The only one I might have an issue with is Phil Hartman as the cat. I don't know, it's not bad, but there's always something about his cynical sense of humor where you're not sure if he's really taking the role seriously or not. A lot of people can find that even funnier, but I don't know, sometimes it seems a touch off-putting to me, but then again that's also kind of the character, so I'm up in the air about it, but it doesn't distract too much for me. I can see how people would enjoy him. Your room is nice, but let's take your mother's. You're no help. If I did have a problem, it's once again kind of like my neighbor Totoro, there's kind of a forced climax at the end. This one's even bigger than my neighbor Totoro because it's like this great big action scene. And on the one hand, yeah, you have a character that can fly around. It kind of makes sense to do something a little action oriented, but it just kind of comes out of the blue. It's kind of different from the rest of the feel of the movie, and I don't know, it's not bad, I guess. I just sort of feel like, couldn't you cut that out and leave sort of the very low-key tone alone? But then again, doesn't every movie kind of need an ending and a third act to build some conflict and drama? I don't know, there must have been some other way to do this. It's not terrible, it's just a touch unfitting. But the rest of the film, like I said, is just enjoying the very simple but likable life of this little girl. You get to know the town, you get to know the neighbors and the side characters, and of course, she gets to fly around. And the flying shots are wonderful. I don't know what it is, but something about the way Japanese animation does flying scenes, they're very well done. There's not even a CG used here, and yet somehow you really feel like she's in the air. Something about the angles and the movement they get, I'm not sure what the magic formula is, but they got it nailed. Somehow they animated so that you feel the weight of the character that's actually flying, and I don't know how you do that, but they found a way. Look at how she drops here, you feel the gravity in that scene. Like I said, I'm not entirely sure why I like this one more than my neighbor Totoro, but something about it really did grab me. Maybe it's because she does explore a little bit more and she does have to travel. But at the same time, you get an idea about how this world works and how people accept witches, and yeah, you almost kinda wanna live in this world. It seems so simple and relaxed that you really enjoy being there. You kinda wanna sit with this artist and talk about what she's painting. You kinda wanna help this old lady bake something for her granddaughter's birthday. And you really get bummed out when the daughter actually doesn't like the thing that she bakes, and you're just like, come on, you spoiled little brat, what's wrong with you? She worked really hard for that, you ungrateful little bitch! You see what I mean? Somehow I get really wrapped up in these tiny little problems that's going on in this town and with this one girl, but screw it, I'm with her. It's like just sitting through a little bit of real life. And yet somehow with this supernatural character. It's such a weird combo, but for whatever reason, it really works. I can't even think of any other words to describe it except delightful. It's just friggin' delightful. I love being with these people, I love being in this town, I love flying around it. And I like seeing it from the point of view of this wide-eyed, adventurous innocent. She's just friggin' adorable! I love it when she gets a package delivered! I love it when she gives that one chef a hug for making that little delivery sign out of bread! I love it when she laughs when they almost got killed riding that weird fan bike thing with that weird inventor boy and just... I can't help it! It's just irresistible! So like I said, if you're not a fan of these kind of stories that, well, don't have much of a story and mostly just atmosphere and character, you probably won't get that sucked in. But me, I enjoyed every minute of it. 
I love that they feel they didn't have to stick to the formula of a three-act structure, that they could just show a little bit of life being lived. Sometimes just experiencing what somebody is going through is more exciting than being told what they're going through. You get more sucked into a world when it feels more real, and reality doesn't always have these three-act structures or these clever lines. Sometimes it's just a little bit of life playing its way. Films like Bambi, Winnie the Pooh, Christmas Story, The Sandlot, they all knew that. And I think Kiki does too. For me, it was the perfect little adventure that made my appreciation of Miyazaki a lot bigger. It's the holiday classic, The Nightmare Before Christmas. Boy, talk about a film that only did okay at the box office, but just exploded in cult merchandise. Every year around Halloween you see this stuff advertised, and hell, every year around Christmas you see it advertised as well. Somewhere the appreciation of this film just went through the roof, and now everybody loves to draw the characters, they love to sing the songs, it's so iconic. But once again, I almost feel like that can backfire and build it up too much for audiences that might be expecting something else. In a sense, that's kind of what I went through when I first saw it. And I saw it when it first came out. It was advertised on TV, Tim Burton's name was plastered all over it, and it came out around the same time that movies like Aladdin, Lion King, and so many other anime groundbreakers came out. So with that said, I thought there would probably be a few more adult jokes thrown in there. You know, like what they did with Robin Williams improvising and so on. But that's not the kind of movie it is. It's more a warped version of those stop-motion Christmas specials that you see every year, except dragged out to an hour and a half. It seems all the holidays are given their own land. Halloween Town, Christmas Town, all that kind of stuff. The leader of Halloween, Jack Skellington, is finally getting tired of his holiday and wants to try something new. Thus, he accidentally stumbles across the Christmas holiday and decides he wants to take it for his own. Showing the people of Halloween what he's discovered and even kidnapping Santa Claus himself, Jack decides he's going to transform a Merry Christmas into a Scary Christmas. Instead of bringing treats and toys, he's going to bring creeps and scares, ultimately resulting in a disastrous catastrophe. The movie has a lot going for it. First of all, the story's wonderful. It's so simple in its setup and yet allows for so much creativity. It's bizarrely very easy to explain and even easier to grasp. The visuals, of course, being a Tim Burton production, are going to be wonderful. And not only that, the music's going to be spectacular. This is the first time in years Danny Elfman has been allowed to write songs again, and man, do they knock it out of the park. You know these songs. This is Halloween, what's this, what's this? Making Christmas, the list goes on. Elfman himself does the singing voice of Jack, and he adds so much character to it. This whole film is practically his movie. But what people might be turned off by, especially those who have had it hyped up, is that it is maybe a little too simple. At least for what people might be expecting. The movie doesn't have a lot of inside jokes or super clever writing, it's sort of very bare bone. Because of this, it doesn't allow for a ton of character or a ton of surprises, but that's not really the focus. It's supposed to operate more like a very basic fairy tale, like a book you'd read to your little kid. In fact, hell, it was originally a book, and in rhyme, too. Some might have a problem with this, and it's understandable. They could have updated it a little bit more, they could have made the characters a bit more interesting. But for a lot of people, the simplicity is what draws them to it. It's a timeless story that can be told to anyone, and anyone can grasp it very quickly. It's similar to something like The Boy Who Cried Wolf. You don't need to know the boy's backstory, you don't need to know his character, you just need to know the very simple layout. Now, is that good for an hour and a half movie? Some would debate no. Me personally, I think there's enough creativity with the songs, the atmospheres, the designs, and even the very basic characteristics that I think it works okay. I'd be lying if I said this was one of my absolute favorite Tim Burton films. I mean, it's good, and I really like it, and I can hear those songs over and over. But it's not something I really watch because the characters are so deep or the emotions are so rich. I'll watch something like Batman or Edward Scissorhands for that. Nightmare Before Christmas is just a very simple, yet still very clever and creative kid story. And like I said, the simplicity is what helps it sell and what helps it stay around for so long. I think that's one of the reasons it wasn't a monster hit when it came out, but people still seem to talk about it and buy merchandise from it all the time. They appreciate the basicness of it, in the same way they appreciate the basicness of Santa Claus, and can immediately connect it to the holiday, or in this case, two holidays. 
I say I appreciate it more than I like it, but I do still enjoy putting it on every once in a while. The songs, the imagery, the creativity, they're just a little too strong for me to resist. It's a simple film that knew just how much to deliver and how much to let you take away from it. And it doesn't look like it'll be leaving anytime soon. Sometimes a movie needs a pig. That is the only reason I can think that they actually put a pig as the main star of Porco Rosso. A charming little film about a rogue World War I veteran pilot who gets into trouble, flies around, fights off debts as well as air pirates, comes across all sorts of cool characters, and is also a pig. And truth be told, there is pretty much no reason for him to be a pig. I mean, don't get me wrong, I know it's symbolic, it's a curse, it's something that he has to overcome, but really, if you wrote that out, it would make little to no difference. It's not like my neighbor Totoro or Kiki where they can do all sorts of cool, big, supernatural things, it's just, he's a guy who happens to be a pig. I just don't get the point of it. The film is about a pilot under the same name, who's trying to make a living but is constantly chased down by people he owes money to. He's constantly relaxing at a hotel run by a friend named Gina, and is constantly being bugged by an egotist named Curtis. Along his travels, he gets shot down and needs his plane repaired by his old mechanic friend. But he's not doing much work anymore, so he hands it off to his daughter named Theo. Skeptical of her ability, she proves herself to be not only good, but downright brilliant at what she does. Soon Porco starts to realize she has the same diabolical brain that he does, and start working well off each other and start planning ways to continue their mischievous adventures. But once Curtis challenges him to one final duel, they make a deal. If Porco wins, Curtis will agree to pay off all of his debts. But if he loses, Theo throws herself in as the prize and agrees to marry him. Will Porco's confidence get him through, or will the demons of the past distract him from the bigger goal? In many respects, it's much more like the calmer Miyazaki projects. I mean, true, there is a lot of flying around and gunfire and stuff, but it's not for, say, a war or something on a grand scale like Nausicaa. It's more along the lines of tailspin, that kind of stuff. Yeah, there's violence, but it's all kind of playful. The characters, once again, are all really funny and really memorable. The dubbing is very well done, with Michael Keaton as the lead. Although not as sexy as that American flyboy. Anyway, I'm off to Milan to fix my plane. You're in Italy? Sorry, baby. Gotta fly. You jerk! But, once again, I just don't get why this character's a pig. In the story, he's cursed because he fled away like a coward. And it's sort of a debate at the end whether or not the curse is actually lifted, which I like that. But I j why a pig? Couldn't you do something a lot more imaginative with this? Couldn't he be like a monster with five arms and that way you can animate them in a fun way? Couldn't you make him like a giant fly so he can fly around already? Or couldn't you just, I don't know, what can you do with a pig? Even the people around him don't seem to care. They're just like, oh yeah, we know him. He's a pig, whatever. And like I said, in most Miyazaki projects, that's part of the charm, but here it just doesn't seem to affect anything. You could just as easily have him be a normal pilot with just a scar on his hand or something, like in Princess Mononoke. The only thing I can figure is maybe they just wanted a little bit more of an identity for the film, like a visual identity. Like, you can look at the poster and be like, a pig flying? What? I'll believe that when pigs fly- oh wait, yeah, I guess that's the joke. But it just kind of seems like a middle that doesn't have a whole bunch of possibilities. Either make him something really grand or crazy, or have what he's cursed with just something very subtle. But like I said before, that by no means makes it a bad movie. For all the dogfights and machine gun fire in this, it's actually very, very relaxed. It's just the characters being really charming and working off each other, having pleasant conversations. The writing's decent, the acting's decent, it's all good. I just don't get the main creative choice. But maybe I don't need to, because the film is still a lot of fun regardless. I don't think I like it quite as much as Kiki because, like I said, they do take more advantage of the idea, but it's still enjoyable and worth seeing at least once. Hell, the animation is so good, maybe it's even worth seeing twice. If you want a film that has a little bit of excitement, a lot of humor, but still at its heart, it's just kind of laid back, this is definitely a good one to check out. A 
lot of times when people try to take a successful TV show and make a movie out of it, the number one complaint is that it just seems like a longer version of an episode. But with DuckTales, it kind of makes sense because every episode was kind of like a mini movie. So why not make an actual movie out of it? In this case, it definitely pays off and it's kind of a shame it doesn't get more attention than it deserves. It's funny because this came out near the same time as The Rescuers Down Under, another adventurous Disney film that doesn't get enough attention. It has all the great animation, the characters you remember, a lot of great action, a few good jokes. It's an enjoyable family film. Scrooge McDuck and the gang are on the search for the treasure of Kali Baba, get it? But their tour guide, named Dijon, is working for an evil sorcerer named Murloc, played by Christopher Lloyd. Just keep searching while I hunt outside! They will not escape! He knows that the real treasure of Kali Baba lies in this magic lamp, and that with his magic talisman that can turn him into any animal, can combine it with the lamp to get unlimited wishes. The lamp, however, falls out of his hands, and instead into the hands of Huey, Dewey, Louie, and Webby who discover the crazy genie inside, played by Rip Taylor. He's zany and goofy, of course, and befriends the kids very quickly. Once Scrooge discovers it, he uses it, of course, for greedy means. And while being chased down by the evil sorcerer, he discovers what truly matters and blah blah blah, action, learning a lesson, all that good stuff. Okay, so there's no groundbreaking morals that are to be learned here, but that's not what DuckTales was all about. In fact, DuckTales wasn't even as much about action as it was adventure. And this is a really enjoyable adventure. I feel like all the characters we've grown to love get the proper amount of screen time that they deserve. Christopher Lloyd is menacing of course as the villain, and Rip Taylor is an adequate genie. I do feel bad because shortly after a much funnier Disney genie would pop about that nobody could really compete with. But for something that's more focused on kids and family and not really adult jokes, I think he works okay. It's fine because the animation on the show was already pretty impressive, so they had to up it even more for the movie, and it really looks good. The only thing that might raise a few eyebrows is the character of Dijon. I don't know, is this an offensive character now? Oh, good money! Ah, what a time we have been having! Yes, I was just not leaving. Goodbye. Back then, nobody thought twice about it, but nowadays with people's sensitivities, I'm not sure if this could be taken the wrong way or not. I mean, he does have a thick accent, and he is a thief. I personally never thought they were saying anything about an entire race, but maybe that's why it never got such a major DVD release. I don't know, he's fine by me, but some people might take it a different way. Like I said before, it's just one big DuckTales episode, but we all really like the DuckTales episodes and what they had to give us, and here it is on a grand scale. I'd be lying if I said it was as good as the original few episodes that were tied together in the beginning. But hey, we're doing a movie now, and you gotta play by movie rules, and for playing by movie rules, I think this film does really well. And it's entertaining, and it's engaging. Does it have a ton of adult stuff? Not especially, I'd say it's more family-oriented. But there's nothing wrong with that. It's done well, it's done creatively, and it's a whole lot of fun. So if you like the show growing up or you're a big fan of adventure, this is definitely one to check out. Whispers of the Heart doesn't get a lot of attention, but it probably should, because for what it is, it does it very well. A coming-of-age story about a girl learning about life and romance and growing up and parents and family and friends, all that stuff. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. Haven't we seen this a million other times in a million other movies made for teenagers and tweens and they're always done awful and they're always super sappy and cliched? Well, while there are a few corny moments here or there, I think this is actually a very well-done film that really addresses the age. I think it very much shows the battle going on with a lot of young people between their passion and what they should most likely do with their lives. Our main character is named Shesuku. She's a bookworm who loves to write and discovers one day that all her favorite books are checked out by another person. She starts to daydream about who this person is, but then realizes it's a boy she can't stand. Over time, of course, they both start to lower their defenses and they realize they actually really like each other. But that's only one part of the story. Another part involves her discovering this antique shop where all sorts of statues and beautiful items give her ideas for stories. She befriends the owner and starts to find there's a real magic to the place. At least in a way that inspires her imagination. So much so that she's now determined to become a full-time writer, even at her young age. She tells her parents she wants to drop out of school and spend all her time trying to write her perfect story. The parents, respectful that she wants to choose her own path, perhaps even a little too respectful, allow her to leave for a bit so she can do exactly that. 
Yeah, some would argue not the best choice, but then again, she does obviously learn her lesson, and I don't know, it's a little controversial, but it's an interesting talking point. And once again, that's kind of the very simple story. We're just following her around, seeing what her life is like, as she herself is trying to figure out what her life is like. Where is she going? What does she want to do? What's her destiny? What's her calling? All that fun stuff that teenagers ask themselves a million times when they're younger. The film has a lot of charm and even a lot of drama, but as before, there's not a ton of story. So again, if this is something that doesn't grab you, you can probably pick it up very quick. But I personally saw it as one of those annoying teen romp stories that were constantly advertised in America in the early 2000s and hell, even nowadays, I'm sure. That's actually done right and done with respect to its main characters, and just young people in general. You kinda get sucked into her stories, you really enjoy her relationship with the man who owns the shop. You kinda hope in a strange way maybe her and the boyfriend can get together even though they may not be perfect or maybe they are perfect, I don't know, it's young love and that's the point of it. Even the corny scenes, I mean like the really corny scenes are still so damn likable. There's a scene where they're trying to learn this American song, and they're trying to learn it in English, which yeah, is a little weird with an American dub, but I think you can still catch on to what they're doing. And as they're trying to sing the song, all of a sudden all these guys are just getting back from a concert and they hear her singing, so what do they do? They all go down and they start playing with her! Oh my god, this is so silly and hokey, but I can't help it, it's just so likable! Maybe it's because the rest of the atmosphere of the film is just so down to earth and so mellow, so that when something like this happens that is pretty cheesy, you kind of accept it because it doesn't happen that much in this film. A kind of corny moment can play okay as long as the rest of it is mostly grounded in reality. It doesn't go for too many obvious laughs or too many traditionally dramatic moments. It instead tries to capture that age when possibility starts to meet the real world when dreams can be dashed, but when you discover, that just means new ones can open up. The voice acting, once again, is very nicely done. I heard the girls that were best friends in this were actually best friends in real life, so they worked off each other much more naturally. They even got Carrie Elways for this one throwaway role that actually plays a bigger part in a later movie, but we'll get to that when we get to that. It's actually clever that they brought him in for just a few lines, but again, I can't say too much until we get to the later film. If I do have one problem with the film is that the ending is really sporadic, out of nowhere, and really fast. I mean, there's like no lead into the credits. It's like somebody says a line and then suddenly we're against these pretty buildings with a nice song playing with the credits rolling. There's no segue, there's no fade to black, there's no nothing, it just jumps straight to it. And yeah, I kinda get the idea with the final line, it's puppy love, it's that age, it's all about falling in love at this certain point in time, and how you are, and you rush into things, it's still weird. But still, the rest of the film is really charming, really nice, really laid back. I feel very much captures an age that isn't life or death, but rather just discovery, influence, and making mistakes here and there. It's kind of all those things you want to see in those popular coming-of-age stories that are also kind of corny, but they're done right. It's soothing, it's enjoyable, and it's definitely worth checking out. Well, if you saw my original Disney Simba review of 101 Dalmatians, you probably won't be that shocked that I think pretty much the same thing about the live-action one. Which is funny because in many respects it is exactly like the original and yet completely different. The story is exactly the same. The characters are exactly the same. The setting is exactly the same. But there is, however, one major difference. The dogs don't talk. A lot of people I remember when this was coming out were really angry and shocked at that. Oh my god, how can the dogs not talk? They talked in the original, holy smokes! And what's it all amount to? Well, very much like the anime one, it's just a movie about watching puppies. And if you like to watch puppies, you'll like this film fine. The story centers around a male Dalmatian and his owner, played by Jeff Daniels, who has his eye on a female Dalmatian, who has a pretty attractive owner as well. Of course, both the dogs and the humans meet up, and they decide to get together. Over time, they get married, and eventually the female dog gets pregnant, giving birth to 15 adorable puppies. But an evil villain named Cruella de Vil, played by Glenn Close, wants to buy the puppies so she can turn them into fur coats. When the owners tell her that they're not for sale, she hires two henchmen, one of them played by Hugh Laurie, to kidnap the puppies and add them to her collection. That's right, a collection. 
for she plans to make tons of fur coats out of tons of puppies. 99 to be exact. When the parents as well as other animals catch word, the race is on to see if they can save the puppies before they're turned into fashion statements. On the one hand, I say to myself, this is a completely pointless movie to exist. Did this really demand to be brought to the live-action cinema? But with that said, if you had to bring it to live-action cinema, I actually think it's pretty reasonably done. I really applaud the fact that they don't have them talk. Not only was the technology not up to it back then, I mean, they could move the lips, but they look kinda creepy, but the movie knows exactly what the people want. They just want to see cute dogs, and if they start talking, it would just be really weird and distracting. Thus, we had to rely on the charm of the human characters, which, for the most part, hold up pretty well. I mean, for such bit parts that have little to them, they actually got some really good actors to bring them to life. The romantic couple are good, the henchmen are good, and yeah, let's talk about Glenn Close as Corella DeVille. On the one hand, I should be really angry at this performance because, yeah, Corella DeVille is an over-the-top character, but this is really over-the-top. Corella was an angry, bitter woman. This is just a laughing lunatic. She's more like a 60s Batman villain than she is a Disney villain, and God, doesn't that sound weird to say? She's making animated Disney villains look subtle. However, with that said, she just cracks me the fuck up. It's kind of like a female Tim Curry or Christopher Walken. There's just no doubt that she's doing whatever the hell she wants. I mean, look at her. She's totally off her rocker. If we make this coat, it would be as if I were wearing your dog. <laughs> <laughs> How can you not crack up at this? Maybe the way to look at it is not that she absolutely captured the original animated character, but she turned it into something 100% different and just ran all the way with it. Hell, ran to the fucking moon with it, she's so over the top. My cozy puppy coat. <laughs> just can't stop laughing at her. She's a fucking riot. For what it is, the film is really not that bad. It's 100% serviceable. I can't really see anyone going into this movie being incredibly disappointed. I mean, what do you think you're going to see? You're going to see Glenn Close over the top and you're going to see cute puppies. That's it. And as that setup goes, it's obvious they put a lot of effort into it. I think the only people that would really want to see them talk are the same people that go see Santa Paws. But I give this movie credit that it tries to be visually interesting, it tries to cast some good people, it tries to tell a lot of the story through silence, which can be very difficult to do. So I guess I appreciate it more than I actually like it. I guess I like it a little better than the anime version, it's just I didn't really even get into the anime version that much. I think it's very simple. If you really like dogs, especially Dalmatians, you'll really like this. And yeah, if you just want to see an actress go batshit insane, it's actually kind of fun to watch for that too. You looking for a fun little family film with cute little animals that's not going to offend anybody? This definitely hits the spot. When Wreck-It Ralph first came out, the term that was being thrown around a lot is that it was the Roger Rabbit of video game movies. And from the advertising, it kinda looked like that. You saw kind of a Donkey Kong-ish knockoff suddenly in with all these really famous characters. There's Bowser, there's a bunch of Street Fighter guys, there's the ghost from Pac-Man. Nothing like this has ever been done in a movie, at least not with video games. It really was the equivalent of seeing Mickey Mouse and Bugs Bunny together, it was so surreal. However, where in Roger Rabbit a lot of these characters keep popping up throughout the entire film, in this one, it's only the first couple minutes. Because of this, there was definitely a crowd of people that kind of felt ripped off. I mean, the commercials, they showed every scene that had a video game character in it. So when you actually watched the film, there was practically nothing left. I kind of like those people want a little bit more of them, but the good news is, the story and characters were so good that you almost don't notice. Much like Roger Rabbit, the story can completely hold up on its own even if you didn't have those characters in there. The main leads and ideas are more than enough to keep it afloat. The film starts off in an arcade where there's an old 80s game called Fix-It Felix. The villain of the game is Wreck-It Ralph, kind of a Donkey Kong style character that doesn't get much respect. Little do we know, there's a whole video game world going on right under our noses. Characters use the plugs and wires to all meet up in one location to shoot the shit, talk nonsense, all that good stuff. 
But Ralph, like a lot of video game villains, is not feeling very loved. He's feeling underappreciated as the bad guy of the game, and wants more attention for the important work that he does. So he starts game hopping to find some way to get his reward. The only thing he can figure is that if he got a medal somehow, that would mean that he's done a great deed. So he travels into one of the much more violent video games, gets his medal, but loses it in another one. Along the way, he comes across a glitch named Vanellope, who lives in kind of a Mario Kart world where nobody likes her either. So they make a deal with one another. If Ralph can help her get in the game and get the appreciation she deserves, she'll help him get his medal back and get him the appreciation he deserves. But there's an even bigger conspiracy going on between villains, side characters, and all sorts of craziness that might result in the end of the video game world as we know it. I'm really impressed how even though it's kind of a complicated story when you get down to it, they explain it in a very simple way. The film is very good at throwing in different surprises and turns around every corner in explaining how the world works. Through warp zones and cheat codes, you can actually change your identity and anything about your environment. Really, the movie takes total advantage of what's given to them. It isn't just using popular video game characters, it's totally embracing the idea of what they have, incorporating both the retro games of the past and the newer games of today. Through all the clever writing and satire, though, there's also a very heartfelt story between Vanellope and Ralph. This is the focus of the film, and yeah, I would have liked to have seen a few more video game characters. This really is where the attention should be. The voice acting in this is beyond pitch perfect. I mean, talk about getting the best people to match these characters. John C. Riley is the big doofus who has a heart of gold. Sarah Silverman is the smart aleck little brat. Jane Lynch is the badass commander with a backstory so funny I dare not ruin it here. The list goes on. This is one of those movies that does so well in combining really great humor in with the story that it's telling. They almost go hand in hand. Like something that's a pretty funny joke can also be a major plot device. The explanation about why Vanellope has to be kept out of the game is actually both really funny and really heartbreaking. Even though these are just video game characters and you play them all the time, you really get wrapped up in what they're going through. You want to see Ralph get his medal, you want to see Vanellope win the race, you want to see all sorts of good things happen to them and overcome evil. And all along the way you're getting these great in-jokes that you don't need to know in order to follow it, but it just makes it all the more enjoyable if you do. I say my only hang up with the film is that we get a little bit of that fourth scene where the good guy has to be bad in order to not hurt the other good guy and it's okay not a misunderstanding or liar reveal story but you know the drill just when they're becoming the best of friends one of them has to do something really mean to hurt the other one but it's also in order to save them and honestly if it hadn't been done a million times before it probably would have worked fine here I mean they do explain everything pretty well. But you just know, after their little fight and moping and doping around, one of them has to come to a realization and go back and say they're sorry and then we can begin the climax. I know we need conflict, I know we need drama, but we also need a little variety. And this has been done a lot of times before. The climax itself is also a little mundane. I mean, at first it's great, starting off with this race and people jumping on top of other cars and stuff, but then you go into this fight on top of a mountain with one of the characters turning into a big monster, and it's not awful, it's just, again, we've seen this a million times and there isn't anything that new to it. But honestly, those are small gripes. Wreck-It Ralph has really likable characters, a very clever setup, and a story environment that makes you realize you don't need as much of the gimmicks as you thought you would. Yeah, it's neat to see Zangief, yeah, it's neat that they reference Lara Croft, but that's not what the movie's about, nor should it be what it's about. It's about a connection between these two polar opposites who also happen to be outsiders, and so they find a way to band together. All while throwing in some really funny side characters and some really great humor. You may not get as many classic characters as you want, but you'll definitely get a whole bunch of new ones that are just as good. It's no secret that Hollywood has been out of original ideas for a while. Everything is either based on a comic, or a book, or a popular series, or a TV show. Everything is retro and based off of something. And while a lot of good stuff has come from it, it is kind of a shame that we don't really see that much new stuff coming out. But then every once in a while, you get something as friggin awesome as Spirited Away. Hands down, one of my all-time favorite films. This movie has the creativity of all the great trippy fairy tales, Alice in Wonderland, Labyrinth, The Nightmare Before Christmas, so much of this really original stuff that you just don't see that much anymore. 
I almost wonder if years later they're gonna try and do a reboot of this, like a different interpretation. The world is so open, the creature's so strange, it actually would kind of be fun to see an artist's different interpretation of it. Most people say you know something is a masterpiece when you can't duplicate it. In a sense, I kind of disagree. People say books like Peter Pan or Christmas Carol are masterpieces, but we're constantly seeing different versions of it all the time. So many new adaptations come out, and I can see the same thing happen with this. It's a world you're both delighted by and horrified by at the same time. You want to live in it, but you also kind of want to run away from it. In my opinion, that's the making of a great environment. The story's about a little girl and her parents that are moving to a new neighborhood. They come across what they think is an abandoned theme park, but really it's an enchanted bathhouse. When the sun goes down and the lights come on, all sorts of various spirits come from around the world to relax here. This terrifies our main character as she finds out her parents have turned into pigs. And she also lives in a world that absolutely hates humans. But luckily, she befriends a boy, who can thankfully also turn into a dragon, who decides he wants to help her. He introduces her to the old lady who runs the place, and decides that if she wants to stay alive, she'll have to get a job. And the rest of the film is her just trying to survive in this bizarre place, while also trying to make friends out of enemies who can eventually help her get her parents back. The girl in this movie named Zen is very identifiable. She is terrified of everything, but so are we. We don't know what this world is, and it is really creepy. We see weird stuff happen. Like I said, her parents turn into pigs. There's monsters around every corner. She has to sneak around or else they'll kill her. But at the same time, you start to enjoy kind of the goofiness of it too. There are a lot of funny characters with unbelievable designs. This whole movie is like a party house for imagination. Every creature has their own unique look. Some more human, some more spider-like, some more lizard-like. And the majority of them have very distinct and likable personalities. What I kind of like about though is unlike something like Kiki or My Neighbor Totoro, they do put a little bit more of a story to it. There is still a goal that has to be accomplished by the end of the film. She has to escape and save her parents. But it's how she goes through it that's the focus and what's so entertaining. She comes across so many delightful people, both delightful in how charming they are or delightful in how terrible they are. Some are even kind of half and half and it's hard to get a grasp on them. Like most of Miyazaki's great work, there is no one straight up villain. There's just kind of rude people, kind of crazy people, kind of sane people. It's just a wide variety. The voice acting, once again, pitch perfect. That's the same actress who voiced Lilo doing the voice of Zen. Man, what a talent. She gets every emotion you need to feel in every scene. She is frantic, she is whiny, and she is a complainer. But it's never to a point where she's annoying. You totally understand what she's going through. Hell, you would probably do half of this stuff too. There's also so many great side stories going on about discovering people's past, finding out the flaws of these creatures and how they can be helped out. But even in between all of that, there can still be moments of just relaxing and letting the atmosphere sink in. My god, my favorite scene is when they're on the train. Nothing is happening here, they're just traveling and looking out the window. But after all the craziness that's happened, it's just the one place you want to be. There's no dialogue here, there's no talking whatsoever. It's just them looking out the window and you can feel what they're going through. This is the power of a visual medium. Not everything has to be spelled out. A scene can just play and you can take whatever you want from it because you know there's such talented people behind it. Talented people that can make you feel afraid in one scene but delighted in the next. If I really had to nitpick anything, I mean friggin' anything in this movie, it's that the owner of the shop also has a twin sister. They literally look exactly alike, even down to what they wear, and with all this creativity and different people and creations, why didn't you make her look different? She didn't have to be a twin sister. I mean, okay, there's one scene where she kind of fools Zen, but it wasn't necessary. You could have made her more beautiful or more ugly or just do something a little different. But like I said before, that's really scraping the bottom of the barrel in terms of nitpicking. I've said before, this is a movie that's so good, I'm actually kind of jealous of it. I wish I could come up with something this beautiful looking. I wish I could create these incredible locations. I wish I could come up with such funny ideas to get rid of curses and stuff like that. It's kind of like the imagination of a brilliant child, but brought to life by brilliant adults. These incredible animators and phenomenal storytellers that just keep you sucked in through the simple needs of our main characters that anybody can identify with, and can identify with very quickly. Being scared of a new place, trying to figure out your identity, having problems with family, putting up with people you don't like, all these things that are so quick to pick up. And it's all done in one of the most incredible environments ever put on screen. 
I love this movie from beginning to end. It's just unbelievable. The acting, the writing, the storytelling, and above all, the unbelievable imagination. Everyone's praised the hell out of this movie, and I'm one of the critics who's just gonna do the same. But it's just that good. I can't find that many things wrong with it. It's the exact kind of movie I would want to see at any age. One that just engulfs me in its world. I don't even know what else to say about it. It's just amazing. Pop it in your DVD player and experience it for yourself. You know what's funny? When I saw Monsters, Inc., the first thing I thought to myself was, yeah, that was okay, but I wonder what they could do with a sequel. I'm assuming if you're watching this, you know how the first film ends, so with that ending, you do kind of see a little bit of possibility. What if Boo did grow up? What if Sullivan kept watching her? What if she became an adult who could actually communicate with monsters? Or maybe when she got to an age, she didn't believe in monsters anymore. Maybe monsters would disappear. Maybe it's something about losing childhood. Oh my god, this practically writes itself. But instead, Pixar said, fuck it, let's just do 80s college movies. Yeah, because those two go so hand in hand. Rather than being a sequel, we have a prequel. Showing how Mike and Sullivan met up for the first time and of course, didn't get along. Each one thinks they're going to be the greatest student at Monster University. So naturally, all sorts of competition and comedic antics take place. But this menacing Dean decides she doesn't like them. Yeah, I don't entirely know why, she just kind of decides she doesn't like them. Maybe because that's what they do in 80s college movies, I don't know. And speaking of which, if you've seen any 80s college movies, I mean any friggin 80s college movies, you've seen Monsters U. It's not a satire of 80s college films, that would be funny. It's not doing anything different with 80s college films, again, that would be funny. All it's doing is taking the exact same characters you've seen a million times and replacing them with monsters. The bully jock, the nerdy worm, the stick in the mud dean, the quirky dorks, the need to make their frat house the greatest frat house that there is, and of course, all these people who don't get along trying to find a way to get along in the end. I remember when I saw the trailer for this, I thought it looked really stupid, but I also remember thinking to myself, it's Pixar! Pixar, the originators of these incredible stories! Finding Nemo, Up, The Incredibles, the friggin' Toy Story films! Surely they wouldn't do something as phoned in as this. But then I remembered Cars 2 and got really depressed. Outside of a few designs of some of the monsters, it's amazing the lack of originality this film has. Everything exists just to follow the 80s college movies tropes. I remember before seeing Muppets Most Wanted, they had a short based on Monsters U, and you know what? It was a million times more interesting. They took advantage of their environment and did something new with it. The only problem is, that was just a few minutes long. This is an hour and a friggin' half. It's easily one of the most boring Pixar films I've ever sat through. You can predict every joke, you can predict every moment that's gonna happen. It's just, it's... Why was this deserving of so much time and effort to go into it? The only new thing that pops up in this film is the ending, and without giving away too much, it is probably the only really good thing in it. It's kind of the idea that you don't need to follow the traditional path that everybody else does, but it's done in a way that's actually kind of clever and probably hits close to home for a lot of people. In fact, if I had to guess, I would assume this whole film was made just so it could get this message across. It's a message you don't see much in movies, and especially in animated family films. Well then, I guess we have the Pixar equivalent of Meet the Robinsons, something that has a really good message but not the best means of displaying it. But hell, even Meet the Robinsons was so strange and bizarre you could kind of admire it for how odd it is. This is more like a textbook about how they made Animal House. Hell, even watching a movie about the making of Animal House would be more interesting than watching this. I've had a lot of fans upset with me that I didn't like this film, but I'm sorry. I just think it's awful. I tried to go in with a clear mind. I tried to open up to the idea that this could somehow work. But it just sucks out all the funny, all the originality, all the interesting characters, all the neat story ideas for such a stale experience. I guess there's nothing bad in it in terms of stuff that'd be like offensive or unwatchable for your kids. But for anyone who's an adult and has seen 80s college movies to death and wants to move on to something else, this is a definite film to scare you away. So remember that story in Whispers of the Heart that the girl was writing about this cat baron who could go into these magical lands and have these great powers? Well, apparently the idea was so good that they decided to make a movie out of it. 
Insert the Cat Returns! A very confusing title seeing how the cat isn't really returning, he's meeting this character for the first time, but whatever. The character he meets is a girl named Haru. She saves a cat from danger in the middle of the road, but it looks like that cat is a magical cat. The prince of a kingdom to be exact, a kingdom ruled by talking felines just like him. Touched by his rescue, he asks Haru if she would marry him. She's so dumbfounded by what she's seeing she doesn't know what to say, and he confuses it for a yes. So the king of the cats, played by Tim Curry, demands that she be brought to the kingdom and turned into a cat herself. Her only salvation is a cat baron, played once again by Carrie Elways, who voiced the exact same character in Whispers of the Heart. Through all his magical antics and mysterious ways, he finds a way to get her out of trouble as she gets back into trouble, and they constantly keep saving each other back and forth. And it's a race to get home as all sorts of whimsical magic keeps taking place, much enchanted scenery is discovered, which of course leads to a lot of fun and some fantastic imagery. It's funny that they got Carrie always to play this part because it actually does sort of have a Princess Bride feel to it. Not the story itself, but more kind of the feel. It is kind of funny and quirky, but it's also kind of like a fairy tale, with magical lands, flying, talking animals. It's a really charming setup. A young Anne Hathaway plays Haru, and she does a wonderful job. Actually playing it very similar to her Princess Diaries character, which I stand by wouldn't be that bad a character if she was put in a better story. This is that better story. She is klutzy and awkward, but she's also kind of wide-eyed, innocent, and just trying to make sense of a world that has very little of it. The rest of the voice actors are great too. Tim Curry, pfft, how can you go wrong? Not entertaining enough. Yes, sir. Whoever's next better not stink, got it? Peter Boyle as the Baron's sidekick. But there is one casting choice that just boggles the hell out of me. I first saw this in the original Japanese language, and one of my favorite characters was this cute little assistant cat. You just saw her and you just wanted to pinch her cheek. She was so cute and she had this little smile and this friendly little voice. She was just adorable. But then, when the American dub came, who did they get to voice her? Excuse me, but I think there's a bit of a problem. Wait a minute, is that Andy Richter? Why is Andy Richter doing what is so obviously a female design? This isn't like in Kiki with Phil Hartman where maybe it's male, maybe it's female, you can't quite tell by the design. This is so clearly female! Every time I see this character, it's just so jarring to instead not hear this cute little fluffy voice and instead Conan's co-host. Emergency exit for all guests right here, please, thanks. And don't get me wrong, he does fine, it's just, it's so clear this isn't the right voice that should go with this character. It's kind of like giving the voice of the Little Mermaid to a male baritone singer, it just doesn't add up. However, the rest of the film is just a pure delight. It's not anything on an epic scale like, say, Mononoke or Nausicaa. It's more like what the girl was writing in Whispers of the Heart, a cute little fairy tale. But as cute little fairy tales go, it's very well done. It's funny, it's imaginative, it's clever. It has enjoyable characters and a lot of wonderful visuals. But hey, why listen to me talk about it anymore? See for yourself and get whisked away. I can't describe the hate for the Lone Ranger that surrounded it when it first came out. Even from the previews, people were just kind of rolling their eyes saying, really? Really? I'm not gonna lie, I kinda had that reaction looking at the trailers too. But when the critics got hold of it and the few people that actually went to see it, by god, they just despised it. They said it was overly long, terribly written, horribly acted, and just made no sense half the time. So I guess a large part of me was really dreading having to review this film, but so many people have been talking about it, I guess it kind of made sense to do so. Having finally seen it, are they right? Well, yeah, but I don't know if I hate it as much as everybody else does. It is definitely a bad movie, and it is way too long. But a part of me does kind of say, if this came out 10 years ago, say before the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, I kind of wonder if it would have gotten a warmer reception. It might have been that really bizarre, distinct western that's never really been done in this way before. But because it did come out after Pirates of the Caribbean, as even done by the same people, everyone just sort of saw it as phoned in pirates except in the Old West. And yeah, they're pretty much right. I guess a part of me does see a little bit of possibility with pirates in the Old West though. Not much, but a little. The story opens with Johnny Depp as the famous Indian named Tonto. He has a job just standing around in a museum. I don't get it, but the makeup's neat. And he comes across a boy who's interested in the story of the Lone Ranger. 
Well, since he was there, he tells the boy to sit back for two and a half hours and listen to his origin story. The Lone Ranger was originally a lawyer who had a very successful brother who was a lawman. One day, after chasing down escaped convict, both of them are gunned down and even his brother's heart is eaten by the villain. Isn't that lovely? But Tonto is fascinated when the spiritual horse seems to pick our main character to be brought back to life. Tonto doesn't believe him as he knows he's an inexperienced action hero. But the horse has made his choice, so Tonto decides to take him up as his partner, bring him back to the world of the living, and follow him to get justice and or revenge on the people who killed him and his brother. Along the way, they come across all sorts of strange characters, colorful baddies, and comedy ranging from the goofy to the downright grotesque. I get the feeling a lot of the worst parts were already kind of told to me, like the guy eating the heart or Johnny Depp being in the museum for no reason and some of the really stupid jokes. So I guess expecting that going in, I paid a little bit more attention to the stuff that I actually kind of enjoyed. I mean, okay, it's over the top and silly, but that's kind of what I expected with a Pirates of the Caribbean Western. Everyone said Johnny Depp was just doing Jack Sparrow as an Indian in this version, and yeah, I see where they're coming from, but I don't know if I quite see it as that bad. I still think he's a good actor, and yeah, sort of the bug-eyed and closed-lipped thing is getting a little old, but he still kept my interest enough. Now, of course, why he was chosen to play a Native American when there's about a million other actors therefore qualified to do so, I'm not sure. Well, yeah, I do. He's a star, money, all that stuff. I know everyone says he's like 190th Native American, but how about somebody who's like majority Native American? Wouldn't that make a little bit more sense? Our main lead does a good job being the fish out of water in this new territory, trying to follow the law while also breaking it, and being fairly charismatic throughout most of it. The villains are mostly a bore, once again tying into some sort of complicated plot about the railroad and land ownership, and oh, who cares, we just want to see cowboys be cowboys. When it does do that, it's kind of neat, in that it's really weird. These are very bizarre towns with very bizarre people in them. But a part of me kind of likes that, because I don't see that much in westerns. I was even kind of liking the way they visually told the story. For example, there's this woman with a wooden leg who also wants revenge on the same person. Even though her business seems booming, she says that he ruined her career. Literally, all they do is show a picture of her as a ballet dancer, and you get it. No tons of dialogue, no big explanation scenes, it's just one picture, and boom, you understand. I like a movie that can do that. I only wish the rest of the movie was like that. At some point, I found myself getting really bored, and I looked on the DVD how long it was, and we weren't even at the halfway point yet. Good God, why does Hollywood nowadays think that if something has to be really big and epic, it has to be super long? Not every movie needs to be Lord of the Rings. Not every movie has to be Lords of Arabia. The same thing happened with the Pirates movie. Stop trying to be these gigantic epics. Just be what you're supposed to be. Be the friggin' Lone Ranger. Cowboy shooting, having fun. Let the epics be the epics and you be something that's enjoyably mindless. And I know it's ironic me saying that seeing how I did an anniversary film that was three and a half hours long, but that had a lot of characters in it, to be fair. This is two. Two guys that we're following for an unbelievable amount of time. I don't care who you put in that role, that's gonna get boring after a while. So yeah, is the movie good? Absolutely not. Is it terrible? Eh, probably? But a good chunk of that comes from the timing. If this was released before the Pirates of the Caribbean films, I think it would have had a little bit more of a chance, and it would have been seen as original and unique and strange and dark and just a movie unlike any other movie. Still having the problems I said before, with it being way too long and such, but I don't think it would have gotten quite the extreme hatred that it's getting today. I'm glad I saw parts of it. I mean, it was just so creatively bizarre. But what does any of it have to do with the original idea of the Lone Ranger and the Cowboys and the Indians and just riding around and having fun? Not much. This feels like Disney knew it hit something big with the Pirates franchise, so they tried to have lightning strike twice. Hell, you could argue even the Pirates franchise it didn't strike twice. The result is a little too much of what we've already seen before, and even then, not done that great. I guess even at its worst, this director's work is just so strange that I always find something of bizarre value to it. So I'm not quite as pissed off as everybody else was at it, but yeah, it's still bad. Not the worst in my opinion, but sadly not worth checking out either. If you've seen my Nostalgia Critic review of Ponyo, you might remember a very particular ending. It's Miyazaki, it has its own charm, and it's just a lot of fun. <laughs> not like that movie Howl's Moving Castle. What?
Since then, so many people have asked me why do I hate Howl's Moving Castle? And the first clarification is, I don't hate it. I just don't think it's very good. And even by that, I kinda mean by Miyazaki standards. It is still visually interesting and has a lot of imagination, and it even has a fair amount of good character. What it doesn't have is focus. This movie is all over the place. And sure, I'm not gonna act like story was always the biggest part of a Miyazaki film, it was much more about environment and characters and so on, but there was still enough of a simplicity to his work that made it really come out as charming. This one just throws so much at you, it's hard to remember even what happened. Howl in the movie is a wizard played by Christian Bale. He comes across a hatter named Sophie, who then comes across a mean lady known as the Witch of the Waste. It appears this witch is in love with Howl, so much so that when Sophie refuses to serve her, she puts a terrible curse on her, transforming her 18-year-old body into that of a 90-year-old woman. Determined to get the curse lifted, she sets out trying to find Howl and comes across, what else, his moving castle. While there, she comes across some colorful characters, a scarecrow known as Turniphead, Howl's apprentice named Markle, and a talking ball of fire voiced by Billy Crystal. She decides to appoint herself the cleaning woman of the castle because she sees it as such a mess. The bad news is it doesn't seem like he can lift the curse. That's not as special Anna's mind anyway as there's two warring countries, and one of them wants Howl to use his magic to help them win their fight. Howl goes back and forth between agreeing to do it and not, all while Sophie comes across the evil witch, who seems to be losing her power and thus the curse seems to be going away, but only a little, and actually it's kind of inconsistent. Sometimes she's older, sometimes she's younger, I'm sure there's a reason why, but honestly, this film goes all over the place and tries to throw so much at you that I guess it got lost in there for me. As a lot of this movie did, I'm constantly trying to remember what exactly it was I watched and what happened in what order and what they meant and where we were, and it's just always doing something. I try to figure out why this scatterbrain of a movie did so little for me when something like Spirited Away, which you could argue also does a lot of strange stuff and throws a lot at you, did so much. The only thing I can figure is movies like Spirited Away or Kiki or Nausicaa is that they're fueled by very simple desires. Sen just wants to save her parents and leave. Kiki wants to be an accomplished adult. Nausicaa just wants to save her people. Here, I forget what Howl's motivation is, and yeah, I know Sophie wants to get the curse lifted, but even that sort of seems like something that's put on the back burner half the time. With the other films, the ideas were motivating the visuals. Here, it feels like the visuals are motivating the ideas. I remember there's a particularly strange scene where Sophie and the witch are so slowly going up these stairs, and it's uncomfortable, and it's odd, and it's not pleasant to look at. I remember asking myself, why am I even watching this? How is this enjoyable or dramatic or creative? It's just weird and unpleasant. That's not to say there aren't some good moments. The visuals, for example, are great. There's a really nice scene at the end where she time travels for some reason or other. Again, it's really complicated and hard to follow. And it creates almost kind of a dreamlike scene. I don't know, it's hard to explain, but the colors and the atmosphere and the mood, it's the only time it felt like I was genuinely watching a Miyazaki film at least in terms of what it made me feel. The rest of the movie definitely looks like a Miyazaki film, and even has some thoughts like a Miyazaki film, but I just didn't feel the same magic as other Miyazaki films. Like I said, I don't think it's awful, and even people who ask me why I didn't like the film kind of nod and understand when I explain it. Even the most diehard Miyazaki fans don't usually consider this one of his best works. It's still impressive, and it's animated great. Hell, even the voice acting is still pretty well done. But it's not really one I look forward to watching again when I had to do Disney Sember. It has nice artwork here and there, but for the most part, it's just kind of confusing and dull. Which is such an odd thing to say with so much bizarre imagery. But if you don't care behind what's motivating it, why should I care to watch it to the end? I don't know, if you enjoy it, I understand. I'm not gonna act like there's nothing to have fun with in this movie. But for me, it's probably the only Miyazaki film where the lack of focus actually got in the way of it being a good product. I know I'm kind of a minority on that, but I'm not gonna lie. I'm not gonna say I like something when I legitimately don't. But I'm not gonna act like it's anything terrible either. I'd much rather watch the worst of Miyazaki than the best of Michael Bay any day. And I don't really see this film as a waste of time. There's still some cool stuff to see. But in terms of getting some really emotional, magical moments, I'd say his other work is more worth checking out. I know a lot of people like it, it's just not for me.
kind of rolled my eyes when I heard they were making a Maleficent movie. I mean, it just seems like a pointless thing to do. Maleficent is a great villain, one of the great villains. She's so charismatic and evil and loves every minute of it and is elegant and clever and diabolical. She's given just the right amount of screen time in the original Sleeping Beauty. So the idea of learning more about her past didn't seem too bright, but at the same time, I was open to it, I guess. When the film finally came out, it became very obvious what they were trying to do. It's the wicked formula again, trying to take a fairy tale we all thought we knew and tell it in a different way where the bad guy doesn't look so bad. When I figured that out, which you can very quickly in this film, I just sort of shrugged and said, whatever, just give me some pleasing eye candy. It did, and I didn't think too much of it. But then later, when I really thought about it, it started to piss me off. Like, really piss me off. I thought about what they were trying to do to one of the great villains, one of the great Disney icons. Turning the mistress of all evil into a simple case of misunderstanding. Turning three of the most likable comic reliefs into these idiotic morons. Turning an iconic Disney fairy tale that has its flaws but was still pretty damn creative into every other poorly CG'd stale story that comes out about fairy tales nowadays. You know what? This movie really sucks. A lot. We start off with the backstory of Maleficent as a little girl, who apparently had wings originally. Okay, this is because she was a fairy. Alright, well, she looks kinda cool, so we'll go with it. She then meets a human boy and they grow up falling in love, but then he finds out when he's older that if he kills Maleficent, he'll be given unbelievable power. But he can't quite do that because he's too nice, I guess? So he decides to cut off her wings instead. She decides from this day on that she hates all humanity and is just gonna be evil. Years later, the king marries and eventually has a daughter, and you know how this goes. Maleficent comes to the party, curses the daughter, and says when she turns 16, she'll prick her finger on a spinning wheel and die. Once again, the fairies are called in to take her away and raise her, but get a load of this. Maleficent always knows where the baby is, and because the fairies are too stupid to raise a child, Maleficent actually kinda raises her herself. Cause, you know, she's not so bad after all. Once the child grows up, she eventually bumps into Prince Charming, they fall in love, and all this time Maleficent is not only watching, but actually getting on pretty good with her. Because, yeah, this is what we want to see. One of the greatest villains of all time having girl talk. Talking about feelings, chilling, laughing, having all sorts of fun. But what the fuck am I watching? It finally gets to a point where Maleficent doesn't want the princess to die. So she knocks out the prince and tries to get them back together because if she does fall in love and pricks her finger, maybe he can wake her up. And meanwhile, the king has gone crazy just because, and he vows to set a trap for Maleficent. Yeah, kind of a shock he didn't do that before. So it's a battle between Maleficent, the hero, and the princess's father, the villain. Yeah, I can tell they really got the idea about what Disney Sleeping Beauty was all about. I won't give away what happens in the end, but remember what they did in Frozen with the true love thing? And how they did a little bit of a twist on it? Yeah, they do that here too. Except, it was already done in Frozen, so it's not really a twist anymore. I guess there's one or two good things in this. Some of the visuals are a little neat. Most of them are pretty standard and not rendered very well. Angelina Jolie looks pretty cool as Maleficent. She's got that devilish smile and a cool look here or there. But while her acting's not really bad, it's not really anything that great either. The actor playing the king is awful. I mean, really bad. I guess he's supposed to be like this really complex character, but he just sort of has these weird mood swings and out of nowhere goes nuts and none of it's convincing and it all sounds so silly. They brought you back a day too soon. I told those three idiots. Lock her up in her room. Something about his voice, I can't explain it. I don't know if it's the inflections or the pitch or whatever, but he just annoys the crap out of me. She's only sleeping forever! And everything else, like I said, is trying to turn this story into something it isn't. Which, okay, Wicked did something like that, and Once Upon a Time did something like that, and they seem to work out okay. But that's part of the problem. They already did it. If you're going to do it now, you have to add something really new or really groundbreaking. Wicked had good writing and characters and music outside of the fact that it was a twist on a story we already know. This is just so standard. And not only that, it takes characters that you already loved, and instead of making them charming in a new way, it just sucks out anything that made them unique. The fairies? Good God! I mean, there's dumb, and then there's just insultingly dumb. 
It's almost like the writer of this movie just didn't like the person who created the fairies originally or something and just really wanted to stick it to them. I mean, they are just so terribly written. I know this is done so that Maleficent looks more like the star, but come on, this is downright degrading. And like I said, Maleficent herself is just not that interesting. I guess this could be kind of a neat spin, seeing how we all know the story, and yeah, it is kind of juicy with her getting her wings chopped off and hating all humanity and stuff and trying to go through a change. But nobody is written with any charm or charisma. I give the actors credit that they're trying to add charm and charisma, but there's just so little to work off of. Nothing about it cries that somebody had this great idea and really wanted to tell this story in a brand new way that was gonna just change the way you look at everything. It's obviously just trying to do what everybody else is doing, and in the process, it insults some of our greatest Disney characters. The fairies were awesome, don't try to make them stupid. Maleficent was great, don't try to make her good. The kings were charming, don't try to make them this asshole. I don't know, if you want more reasons why I hate it, go watch the honest trailers of it. I guess if you're just looking for something that's kinda pretty, a touch creative, and reminds you a little bit of those classic fairy tales, then it's a harmless waste of time. But if you're looking for something that's gonna suck you in and you can't wait what's gonna happen next and it's very psychological and intriguing and, I don't know, anything not stale and hasn't been done a million times, then you can definitely give this one a pass. Tales from Earthsea is based on the series of novels that sadly I haven't read, but based on the majority of the film I've seen here, I just may need to. It starts off with a ship of people that look up and see a bunch of dragons wrestling. Okay, a strong start. But this news makes it back to the king of the land saying that dragons never fight, that this is a horrible omen. They talk about how a lot of strange shit has been going on, like how wizards have been losing their power, balance is being thrown all over the place, something bad is coming, something terrible. And just before they start to proceed forward to figure out what to do about it, the king, who seems like a pretty cool nice character, is killed! I thought this guy was going to be the main character, he seemed so nice and strong-willed. But no, the kid that stabbed him is the main character, and on top of that, he's the son of this guy! He steals the sword, runs away from the palace, and the opening credits roll. Holy shit, that's the way to start a story! A million questions were racing through my mind. How is this the main character? What possessed him to kill his father? His father seemed pretty cool. Why are dragons fighting? Why is it bad that they fight? Isn't that what dragons do? What place do they have in this environment? Why is the sun suddenly normal now? He seems afraid of these wolves and like really creeped out. Wasn't this the psycho that just killed his dad a moment ago? Just, oh my God, it's just racing through my head. Everyone thinks you have to start off these epic fantasies with these big battles or explosions or something. But in reality, all the great fantasies start off as little stories. They do this so you can connect with the main character, who's usually somebody who's kind of timid, kind of afraid, but about to go on this big adventure. And that's exactly what this movie does. We get to know our main character, who is the prince, who's on the run from his heinous crime and comes across a wizard, played by Timothy Dalton. I'm convinced this guy is Liam Neeson's monotone if it was made more interesting. Just based on his performance, I would follow this guy anywhere. He's stern and strict, but he definitely sounds like he knows what he's talking about. It doesn't sound like a guy who's trying to sound badass, he sounds legitimately badass. Along their way, they come across a girl with a burn mark on her face. She seems beyond socially awkward, and naturally the prince and her don't get along. But it also turns out she's been adopted by this woman who's a friend of the wizard. Or mage, is there a difference? I don't know, I guess I'll call him mage. Slowly but surely, they start to open up, and of course, they find out they have a lot in common and start a nice relationship together. But troubles are brewing when another evil mage named Cobb, played by Willem Dafoe, is one of the few wizards who hasn't lost his magic. Thus, he plans to use the imbalance that's going on in the world to somehow achieve eternal life. And the mage seems to be the ticket how. Along the way, we discover secrets, magical powers, and the truth about what people's spirits, as well as their physical bodies, are capable of. For the first two thirds of this movie, I was absolutely in love. Everyone always said this film was just okay, but I didn't know what they were talking about. I was sucked in. I was sucked in because I knew this was a smaller story that was taking place in a grander battle. They kept talking about how something big was coming, some sort of big change, and there's just this feeling of dread throughout the whole thing. It's kind of like in Game of Thrones, how when you get down to it, there really aren't that many big battles in it. But it's all about the build-up and establishing the character. While there's not quite as much talk of strategy in this, there certainly is a feeling of a lot of impending doom. 
Cobb, for example, is one of the creepiest villains. Willem Dafoe throughout almost the entire performance does nothing but whisper his lines, and it is just unsettling. His voice is like a spider crawling its way into your ear. It's just so uncomfortable whenever he speaks. He's so hard to figure out, too. I mean, you know he's a bad guy, but he always has this confident smile on his face. You know he can do these terrible big things, but he's also very frail and moves very little. You have no idea what this guy is up to, but you know he has everything figured out. And that's one of the creepiest things about a villain. One that just has no fear whatsoever. So like I said, watching this film, I was just engrossed. Where was this all going? What's it building up to? What's the bigger, grander picture that they're finally gonna deliver? But then, when we get to the third act, I was really disappointed. Instead of a big battle, or getting a bunch of Vancers, or getting an army together, or just something that seems larger, it's just a small fight in a castle with the hero wielding his sword, a few magic spells thrown, and just fighting a great big monster while trying to save the damsel in distress. Oh man, what a letdown! For a film that opens up with dragons wrestling and so much dread and people saying there's this great imbalance and something terrible is coming, this is that terribleness that was coming? I totally accept the possibility that maybe this is just the first part of the story. Like, maybe this is the Fellowship of the Ring part and there's going to be more to it. But even in Fellowship, they knew how to make a bigger deal of their climax. How to make you feel that this is important stuff you're watching. Ironically, the problem I always had with Fellowship is that you never felt the simpler side of it. The normal quiet life of our main character that's going to be interrupted. Everything in Fellowship was big and huge, even the party they threw. This movie has the exact opposite problem. The simpler stuff is there and is very well done. And it has some phenomenal build-up for what they could possibly deliver. But in this movie, it never is delivered. Even the ending kind of looks like they're done and wrapping up. Speaking of which, I don't understand the ending at all. Without giving away too much detail, there's another interaction with a dragon, kinda, sorta, and I just don't get it. It didn't seem like something that was meant to be abstract or open to interpretation. It seemed to be like, yeah, you're supposed to know what this is. You're supposed to know what's going on and why it's going on. The film is directed not by Hayao Miyazaki, but by his son, Goro. And for a first film, it's really impressive. Like I said, I love the first two-thirds of this movie. I don't think I've ever been so hyped to see where a fantasy film was going. I really thought this was going to be like a Narnia, something that starts off so simple and basic but turns into this grand, epic battle. Instead, it feels more like the last level in a Zelda game. Even Willem Dafoe seems to go from that terrifying voice to something that seemed more Green Goblin-ish. But still, does that mean I should dislike the entire movie for that? I don't think so. I still love the majority of this film. If they ever did make a sequel to it, I'd probably watch it, in the hopes that it actually does go somewhere bigger. Like I said, I haven't read the books, and I have no idea how close it is or far it is to it. But for what it is, I really enjoyed the journey. I just didn't enjoy where it ended up. I'll emphasize right now, though, that I'm one of those people that just likes these kind of stories, the stories that start off small and get bigger and bigger and bigger. For example, I'm one of the few people that actually like the first Hobbit. I kind of felt like it was the Fellowship of the Ring I never got. So I don't think this is a fantasy that's going to engulf everybody. Hell, most people say it's okay at best. But personally, I could get lost in this world and its environment and watch these characters all day. Yeah, I know this review is kind of all over the place, but hopefully you can get an idea if this is something you'd be interested in. Take your chances and see what you discover. It's Disney's runaway hit, Frozen. Just a little over a year since it came out and people still won't shut up about this movie. It's a cultural phenomenon. I have not seen an anime film from Disney get this much attention since Lion King. Everybody's still singing the songs, everybody's still quoting the lines, everybody's still selling the merchandise. It's just a monster. Like probably most of you, I kind of agree it's all over the place and most likely overplayed. But, I'm not gonna lie, I'm one of those people that loves it just as much as anyone else. The story is about two princesses named Elsa and Anna. Elsa has a curse where she can control the cold. She can make it snow, shoot ice beams, create snowmen, all sorts of craziness. But one night, as a little kid, she accidentally almost kills her sister. Her mom and dad take them to a group of rock gnomes who say that they can save her, but they have to keep the power a secret. So they erase Anna's memory and decide that it's best to keep them as far apart as possible in hopes that her power won't hurt her anymore. Years go by, and after the parents tragically die, the two of them grow up into polar opposites. 
Elsa, not surprisingly, is an awkward introvert, and Anna is a social butterfly, ready to open up to anybody. On the day of Elsa's coronation as queen, Anna accidentally reveals Elsa's powers to everybody, causing Elsa to run away and leave the entire kingdom in ice. So it's up to Anna to find her sister and convince her to come back and stop all this winter. Along her way, she comes across a climber named Kristoff, a magical snowman named Olaf, and all sorts of crazy adventures trying to not only save the kingdom, but her sister as well. There are so many things to talk about with this movie, it's hard to know where to even start. Probably the thing I'm impressed with most is their ability to break certain cliches while still holding true to others that make Disney so popular. But they do it in a way that's not so obvious. It feels very natural in the way they set up these characters. I thought back to films like Enchanted where they just hammered the lesson in that they're going against these Disney cliches and here it just felt like it was part of a story they would tell even if it wasn't Disney related because it ties into what's going on nowadays and will continue to happen in the future. For example, there is still a romance that blooms in only a few days, but they also mock the fact that she's going to marry somebody that she just met, which of course is a big criticism of female leads in the past. But this also makes sense for the character. She has been shut away for so long that she would just give herself to anybody. It's a new experience and she would be excited, but this movie is showing the dangers of it. In fact, originally, I was kind of against the idea that there was sort of a last-minute villain thrown in, but without giving away too much, this once again shows a really good lesson. The surprise reveal shows the danger of being too trusting to anybody. Which is not only a good lesson for kids, but a really good lesson for kids nowadays. With the social media and everybody on it so often, both Anna and Elsa are perfect extremes to learn something from. Elsa is an introvert who wants to stay away from people, much like how some people can just be glued to their computers and phones and not go outside that much. People need to know how to socially interact if they're going to survive. But Anna has the opposite problem. If you reveal too much about yourself and will just give your heart to anybody, again, like a lot of people on the social media do, there can be a downside to that as well. The characters are all so likable. Not only do we have two princesses in this, but one of them moves on to Queen, isn't evil, is actually really respectable and smart, and the other isn't so dainty and basic. She's really, really funny. They don't mind if they make her a little bit of a ditz here or there because it's totally explained why. The situation totally backs up why she would be this way, but at the same time, she's very likable. You love her passion. And there is something so nice knowing that the majority of the humor that comes from this movie comes from the main characters and not all just in comic relief. The main characters can be funny and goofy. But with that said, even the obvious comic relief they do bring in isn't really that bad. I don't think Olaf is a hilarious character, but I got a laugh out of him once in a while, and he wasn't annoying. Where most Disney sidekicks get a lot of their humor from yelling and being loud, this one actually whispers a lot of his jokes. I haven't really seen that in a Disney fairy tale, and it's actually really effective and funny. The music? What can I say? You're all still humming these tunes. Let it go, you want to build a snowman for the first time in forever. I remember when I was first talking about these songwriters in the Winnie the Pooh movie, and I said I so want them to go on to something because these are such great songs. Holy shit, did they get rewarded for their talents. People are still singing these songs. They're releasing it in theaters with little sing-along lyrics at the bottom. It's just insane how popular they are. And what I love about it too is that the songs help the movie and tell the story. That's what the Disney musicals did. They didn't just say let's get a pop star like Elton John to write five songs that honestly if you took them out you wouldn't miss that much in terms of story. Or someone like Phil Collins who just sort of sings in the background that you could have just replaced with orchestral music and nothing would change whatsoever. These are songs that actually explain what the characters are going through and move the story forward. And they're done fantastically. I know I did a Nostalgia Critic video criticizing the fact that it's played all over the place, and yeah, it is. I'm not gonna act like it isn't. We are overplaying it. I'm sure it's driving most people insane. But the sad truth is, I'm one of those obnoxious people who plays it over and over. That doesn't mean I won't make fun of it, but yeah, I'm one of those morons who does it. But to be fair, I only listen to it in my car, without any kids to play it for. Actually, this is sounding really pathetic, but I don't care! I love the music that much! The film is also gorgeous looking. I could almost see people whipping this out around every Christmas. Look at the way they shoot winter. Look at the colors. Look at the angles. Look at the landscapes. I could get lost in this winter. I want to live in this winter. Which, I know I kind of do, but this one looks nicer. If I did have a problem with anything, I would say that the backstory is really rushed. I know for some people those elements can really turn them off as I've heard their major criticisms like why they did do this to the two little girls and shouldn't have grown them up this way and so on and so forth. 
And I get it, it is kind of a plot hole and in the development of our main characters that sort of causes all this. But personally, I give it a little bit of a leeway because I say that's kind of the fairy tale element. Sort of like, how is Luke Skywalker firing one torpedo gonna blow up the entire Death Star? Or how is it the Joker took down the Batplane with one bullet from his gun? It's one of those creative liberties that, for me, is worth going through to get to the best parts of the story. With that said, Frozen is one of my top 10 favorite Disney films. Hell, maybe even top 5. It brought me right back into that feeling that I was seeing something big and grand and Disney. And on top of that, it was a fairy tale. When's the last time you saw a traditional fairy tale take the world by storm? I don't mean something like Tangle that was a hit or Once Upon a Time that's doing well. I mean like take over the world. It's been a while, but it's great to see again. And yeah, like I said, it is probably being exploited a little too much and all over the place. But hell, I'd much rather have kids and adults rewatch this than, say, Transformers or Twilight. This one has so much more creativity and intelligence to it. And music, and visuals, and characters, and just, I'm just gushing all over it again. It's one of the few films I can just proclaim as an instant classic. A film you can guarantee years from now millions of people are still going to be watching and sharing with their kids. Hell, with other adults. I'd say go check it out, but pff, who the hell hasn't? Just go watch it again. I know I'm going to, and have a hell of a lot of fun doing it. It only figures to celebrate Christmas Day with a Christmas movie, and the Muppet Christmas Carol seems to be a good one to talk about. It's so interesting that for so many younger people, this is their introduction to the classic Charles Dickens tale. I shouldn't see that as a bad thing, seeing how the Mickey Christmas Carol was my introduction to it. And truth be told, it's not a bad way to be introduced. Is it the best way? No, but I think it's still pretty reasonably well done. Ebenezer Scrooge, played by Michael Caine, is the town's most hated man. One of his workers, Bob Cratchit, played by Kermit the Frog, and yes, I know somebody else plays Kermit the Frog, but come on, work with me here, tries to get Christmas Day off to spend with his family. After Scrooge begrudgingly agrees, he's told that he's going to be haunted by three ghosts that night. The ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future. Each one shows him exactly that, the past, present, and future. And slowly over the course of the film, Scrooge starts to realize the importance of Christmas, the importance of being nice, and the importance of sharing his wealth with puppets half his size. The film is pretty by the book in following the original story. They have Gonzo and Rizzo as the narrators who constantly get beaten up throughout the entire movie. And all the other Muppet characters play the parts that we know from the book. The one that actually has me pissing my pants with laughter is Fozziewig. By God, I swear this whole movie was put together just so they could do that pun. On the whole, it's a decent film, especially when you look at the sets and the atmosphere and the colors. It's clear the focus of the movie was not to tell a great Muppet film, but rather a decent Christmas Carol. Now the downside is, some might find that as a turnoff. As someone who loves the Muppet movie and the Muppet caper in their early films, I really thought there was going to be a lot more humor to this. Like, if you saw the Muppets do a Christmas Carol on, say, The Muppet Show, you know everything would go wrong. Their personalities would get in the way and it'd be all crazy and stuff would be blowing up and falling apart. But here, it's got to be done more seriously. Which isn't a bad thing, I guess. It just doesn't feel that Muppet-ish half the time. But even that's made up for when they do something actually a little different from the story. Stuff that maybe other versions should consider putting in. One of my favorite additions is that the Ghost of Christmas Present has a bad memory. Why? Because he's always living in the present. So sometimes he'll repeat things, like he'll introduce himself twice or say a sentence he already said. That's a really clever idea. I also love the design of the Ghost of Christmas Past that's kind of a baby but kind of an adult too is sort of ageless. But there are definitely some moments that are by no means terrible but can definitely be a little awkward. While the songs for the most part are pretty damn good, some of them almost sound a little too cleaned up. Like the Love Is Gone is sung almost a little too nice, you almost miss the emotion of it. And let's get to the part that's really gonna make you wanna kill me. I don't think Michael Caine is that great a Scrooge. You heard right. I don't think he's awful, but there are just so many moments where I feel like he's really just phoning it in. For example, what the fuck is this? <laughs> it just cracks me up how weird it is. There's also some line deliveries that just feel lazy to me. Like look at this scene where he just sort of calls Bob Cratchit's name and it just sounds like really bad acting. Mr. Scrooge. Bob. Bob Cratchit. 
Does anyone else feel that was just kind of half-assed? But the biggest scene, and I mean quite literally the biggest scene, is when he's supposed to break down and change his ways. There's no big music, there's no big visuals for it. It all just relies on his performance. And I'm sorry, it doesn't deliver. I don't feel a thing for this guy. Ebenezer the Scrooge. I will live my life in the past, the present, and the future. I will not shut out the lessons the spirits have taught me. I don't entirely blame him, as the staging and pacing in this scene is kind of weird too. But I think of all the other Scrooges and how I felt so bad for them, and they just made this such a huge scene, and here it's just a guy who looks like he's trying to be sad while saying some lines. But with all that said, I'd say only about half of the performance is not very good. There actually is a half that's pretty decent. And strangely enough, a lot of it's in the musical numbers. Michael Caine is not a very good singer, but he actually does put a lot of passion when he's doing the singing roles. He actually does feel very jubilant when he's singing the final song. And I really love the addition of having him sing a duet with the version of his past love. That's a great idea, and he does it very well. He also has the threatening look and stamina of a proper Scrooge, so I can't say he's terrible. Because when he does something good, it is good. But for me, it's only about half the performance. I don't know, it could very well be that I love Christmas Carol so much and I love the character of Scrooge that I really, really hold them to a high standard. In fact, honestly, I can probably count on my one hand how many great Scrooges I think there really are that I've seen. But still, that's not what you're coming to see. You're coming to see the Muppets. And the Muppets do fine. Even though I don't feel like it's a traditional Muppet movie, I do kind of give it credit that it tried to do something really serious. They still address a lot of the dark stuff. They still kill off Tiny Tim. This could so easily be awkward and laughably done, but it's actually pretty legit. And yeah, like a lot of people, I watch it every year too. It's a strange combo, but a decent one. The kids will enjoy the puppets, the adults will enjoy the jokes, and the Christmas lovers will enjoy Christmas. Have a wonderful holiday and possibly pop this film in. It's almost kind of pointless to talk about Ponyo, seeing how I've done a whole entire Nostalgia Critic review dedicated to it. But let's take a quick look anyway, because this time we won't have any jokes or anything. Just a straightforward, honest opinion. The film is very loosely based on The Little Mermaid, and when I say very loosely, I mean there's practically no reason to connect it to The Little Mermaid. It's a female half-human half-fish that comes out of the water, befriends a male, and that's about it. Everything else is completely 100% different. It has less to do with The Little Mermaid than... Well, the Little Mermaid. Ponyo is an enchanted fish who comes from a magical man named Fujimoto, played by Liam Neeson. One day she decides to go exploring and comes across a boy playing in the sea. As she becomes more and more human, the boy and her start to form a very strong relationship. The longer she stays human and out of the sea, the more it seems to throw the world out of whack. And I mean really out of whack. Towns are suddenly put under water, the moon is about to crash into the earth, it suddenly gets totally insane. But you almost wouldn't notice it, seeing how totally calm and relaxed everybody seems to be. Yeah, so their houses are underwater. Big deal. You know what? It's a good day for a picnic. Let's row our boats, go fishing, just totally have fun on this otherwise beautiful day. Yeah, it's that kind of movie. Can Ponyo get back in time in order to set everything right? Well, again, being that kind of movie, you can probably guess what the outcome's gonna be. Weird. And that's definitely a word to describe this movie. Weird. It's still charming and really likable, but it is weird. The funny thing about it is that even though there is a lot of surreal imagery, that's not what's so strange about it. The strangeness really does just lie in the story. You couldn't predict the reactions or the choices that these characters make, or the outcomes that they produce. On the one hand, it's just so strange to get a grasp on. I mean, it seems like this is a tiny little story about a girl befriending a boy and all sorts of little magic. But then he hear talks about the moon is going to destroy the world, and it's like, where did this come from? But on the other hand, that's also what's kind of charmingly strange about it. It's basically in its own strange setup where even if the world seems to be underwater, it's kind of okay. Something about that optimism is very bizarrely likable. Unexplainable, to say the least, but still likable. And I think a lot of that just comes from its simplicity. 
All this chaos is constantly going around these characters, and yet the biggest concern for our main lead is to get Ham. Yeah, she discovers what Ham is and is totally obsessed with it. How can you not like a film so weird? Even the art style seems a lot simpler compared to other Miyazaki movies. But I don't mean that in any way to insult it, I think that's just the style. It's drawn much more like a kid's book, and it's kind of told in that way too. Well, for the most part, again, the complications of the plot are really... I don't know, I don't want to say lazy, but not really needed. But then again, maybe that's the point of it. Maybe it is meant to just exist in this world where this extreme simplicity and this extreme complicated batshit insane plot can exist together and just sort of create its own weird setup. I don't know if that necessarily makes a classic, but it definitely makes an interesting experience. And at the heart of it is still some likable characters, some enjoyable animation, and a whole lot of charm. I really like watching this kid and just how ambitious and excited she is. The tiniest things just get her going nuts, and yeah, her happiness is kind of contagious. So does the film make a lot of sense? No. But is it meant to? Probably not. The two words I constantly hear from people in describing it is weird, but cute. And I think that's sort of the reaction I get out of it too. It's crazy, but it's adorable. It's all over the place, but it's a lot of fun too. I definitely wouldn't put it up there with Kiki or Spirited Away, but it's definitely a movie that's likable enough to put on a few times. Take a look and experience the madness for yourself. Ever since the movie came out, everyone's been telling me, you gotta see Big Hero 6, you gotta see Big Hero 6. All the critics love it, all the audiences love it, it's been the number one movie for a couple weeks, it's just incredible, oh my god, fucking Big Hero 6. Naturally, I got pretty excited to see Disney do kind of a superhero film, as when I really thought about it, I don't think we've actually seen one from them. I mean, we've definitely seen heroes in their movies, but not as much comic book characters. I paid my ticket, went on in, and let me tell you, I have never felt an overwhelming sensation that a film was 100% okay. It's honestly hard to think of what else to even say about it. It's okay. How's the fighting? It's okay. How are the characters? They're okay. How are the visuals? They're okay. To be honest, I'm really dumbfounded why so many people are talking about this film. It's not bad. It's not good. It's just okay. It's about the most standard superhero film I've seen in a while. Not that it has nothing new, it's just all the new stuff is okay. The film takes place in the future with a boy named Hero. Hero is a boy genius who has an older brother who's also a boy genius. But Hero is also walking that thin line of applying himself to do great things, or just using it to benefit himself. So his brother introduces him to a team of other super geniuses, and he decides he wants to be a part of it. But to get into the school that they're all in, he has to win this competition. Sure enough, he comes up with an invention that wins everybody's eye, but loses everything in a fire, including his brother. A long time later, he comes across one of his brother's inventions named Baymax. Baymax is kind of like a one-robot hospital. He's designed to help people who are in physical or even mental pain. But sure enough, Hero sees an opportunity to put this machine to good use. When he sees there's a masked villain who's using his invention for evil, it's up to Hero, Baymax, and his newfound team of geniuses to not only find out what's going on, but to do it as, what else? A super team. I'm not gonna lie, literally I predicted who was gonna die, who was gonna be the villain, and even how the movie was gonna end. I wouldn't usually mind as it's more a part of the journey, but this movie seemed really bent on surprising us with its twists as well as its comedy and both were unbelievably predictable. It was really strange to see all these characters that seemed to be designed well, but I felt like I've seen them in a million other projects. You got the stoner loser, you got the hyper geek, you got the cool one who chews the bubble gum, and most of their dialogue is just centered around the fact that they're making catchphrases that they're gonna repeat later. And when they do, it is so forced. And don't get me wrong, I know a lot of these superhero stories have a lot of that traditional manipulation, saying catchphrases, defeating supervillains, all that good stuff. But superhero films have come a long way recently. Movies like Batman, The Dark Knight, and of course all the incredible Marvel movies that are coming out now, which ironically this is a part of, are light years beyond what this movie's trying to do. The only thing that sticks out about it at all, which I guess is kind of traditional Disney, is the relationship between Hero and Baymax. It's cute, simple, and never seems to go too forced. 
Baymax seems to keep to his exact programming, yet we still feel something for him. It's not like he breaks it and says he wants to be human or something, he just stays the exact being that he's supposed to be. The best parts of the movie are with him trying to help Hero deal with his loss. When the movie focuses on that element, it's good. But when it tries to actually be a superhero film, it's kind of dull. It's not like there's no imagination put into it, it's just imagination I've seen in a million other places. It's not like I didn't see characters, I just kinda saw characters that were 10 years behind the curve. But like I said, I can't think of anything that was awful. It was just kind of predictable and kind of been done before. Like, a lot. Even San Fran Tokyo, what an idea combining these two cities together. But I mean, look at it. It's creative, it's not lazy or anything. But doesn't it also kind of look like a million other futuristic cities you've seen before? With a million other characters you've kind of already seen before? Maybe if they kept it more simple, just focusing on the boy and the robot, I would have enjoyed it a lot more. As is, it's just all right. Nothing terrible, nothing spectacular, just all right. But maybe that's not what you'll think. Maybe you'll go and see it as spectacular like the majority of people do. Fair enough, there's nothing really that bad in it. Maybe I'm just not the right person who can see the greatness in it. If you're really curious, check it out for yourself. The secret world of Arietti seems very much returning to the form that films like Kiki and Totoro did. Except in this case, they take the idea of a very small story and literally make it a very small story. Based on the book The Borrowers, we follow the world of very tiny people that live in a little house and how they manage to get around without ever being seen. But our main character, Arietti, does get seen once, coming across a boy who apparently seems to be very slowly dying. He seems to have come to peace with it and talks about his life with her. Over time, they find they have a lot in common, share a lot of their experiences, and form a very strong friendship. But things start to get a little crazy when one of the other people in the house starts to think there are little people that are roaming through the wood and dedicates all of her time and effort to finding out where. Once again, that's about all there is to the story, but once again, that's about all that you need. The characters are all very likable and all very intelligent. I really like hearing the conversations that they share with one another. You really feel a sense of family in this film. A lot of films I see that focus on family have a lot of jokes and one-liners and put-downs and stuff, kind of like a sitcom. Here, everyone seems to talk like a real person. The only one who seems to speak differently is the boy with the terminal illness, but that's a boy with a terminal illness. And it's really fascinating to get inside his mindset. To hear how he sees the world and how he feels so very small in it. Which of course is very fitting, telling this to a very small person. They both have big worlds with big limitations and yet for entirely different reasons. But even for all their talking, there's still a lot of visual imagination to this movie. Even just them trying to get across the kitchen is like this really big event. There's a great scene where they have to do it at night and they have to be quiet. It's almost like watching an episode of Mission Impossible. It's just so suspenseful. And it's also great to see just how they get through this world. All the little secret passages, all the devices that they make. The engineering, even on such a small scale, is very impressive. The only downside I have, which I'm starting to accept more and more, is just sort of a criticism of Japanese cinema, I think, is that the ending, once again, seems a little rushed. At least, in the placement of the credits. The movie seems to be building up to a proper epilogue, and then they just start showing the names of everybody that's in it. Doesn't that usually mean it's time to get up and time to walk away? I can't really focus on what they're showing me if I'm reading the people that worked on the film. And I really would have liked to have been totally engrossed in that and just watched that without a bunch of names flashing in front of me. I don't get the creative choice, but I can definitely say it happens in a lot of anime films from Japan. Maybe it's a creative style I don't get, but it does kind of bother me. But it in no way ruins the film. This is a really charming, likable piece. It's not any huge epic, but at the same time, you do really get sucked into a lot of their problems. You do kind of take a little bit of a gasp whenever they're about to be seen. You do kind of become fearful that they might get caught. But at the same time, you enjoy the simpler moments of them just sitting back and having a conversation about the greater things as well as the smaller things. I really liked it, and I definitely enjoyed its very laid-back structure. If you're looking for big adventure, you'll get elements of it here and there, but it's mostly a very calm, subdued family film. But hey, what the hell's wrong with that? Give it a shot and see for yourself.
Okay, so I'm going a little out of order on this one, but at the same time, I couldn't get into Into the Woods in time to do a Disney December for it, and yeah, I'll just do it by popular demand in January. But until then, let's do one I actually have gotten a lot of requests to do, The Brave Little Toaster. A film a million times better than it's deserving to be. I mean, just listen to that title. The Brave Little Toaster. This sounds like a story for one-year-olds that should have little to no effort put into it. And even the setup, in some respects, is kind of like that too. A bunch of appliances, with eyes, mouths, the whole thing, have been sitting around the house waiting for their master to return. But a long amount of time has passed and they're starting to feel like he's never going to come back. Fearing he might be in trouble, they decide to leave the home and go looking for him. The rest of the film is the great big journey they take to try and find where he's gone. Our characters include a radio, played by John Lovitz, a vacuum, an electric blanket, a lamp, and of course, our brave little toaster. For a setup that sounds almost insultingly simple, it's really kind of surprising how much effort they put into it. There's a lot of quieter moments in this movie, which when I saw as a little kid, I was really impressed by. It kind of made me feel more adult to watch something that wasn't constantly trying to be loud and singing and obnoxious. It could let softer moments just be softer moments. But with that said, there's definitely a lot of craziness in it too. They come across a lot of neat characters, a lot of wonderful designs, a lot of scary designs, and even a few hummable musical moments. I especially love the Garbage Dump song. It has a really good beat to it, and even years later, I once in a while catch myself humming it. I to come back to a graveyard. I beg your pardon, it's quite hard enough to live with the stuff I've learned. You're worthless. One of the fun things about it that you know I would enjoy is that there's a lot of scary scenes in it. Yeah, for something called the Brave Little Toaster, there's a lot of really creepy, intense moments. Look at this climax. This is pretty fucking hardcore for a little kid's film. <laughs> but even beyond that, the characters are actually kind of enjoyable. They're all really simple, but really unique and distinct. They all kind of come together and help each other out as a group, and they all have their moments to shine. I really appreciate this film not just for being enjoyable, but for taking an idea that pretty much had nothing going for it and just putting their damnedest into it. This is not a lazy project. This is something that people came together and said, you know what, this is weird, this is odd, but we're going to do everything that we can with it. It's a good film. Okay, not phenomenal, but I don't know what kind of phenomenal things you can really do with this setup. Hell, I'm amazed they even made it to okay standards. This is a fun little adventure to take your kids on. It has enough colorful songs and characters to keep them interested, and enough scary moments to get them going, ooh, what's gonna happen next? It's not spectacular, but there's just something to the atmosphere I really like about it. Every action they make, you feel the consequences of, and you're totally rooting for them every step of the way. Who the hell would have thought toasters would lead such interesting lives? says I should really hate from up on Poppy Hill. Like, really hate it. This is a phenomenally cliched story. A high school girl comes across a high school boy who, big shock, don't get along. But the more they hang out, the more they realize maybe they can get along, and start to form a romantic connection. But once she shows that her father has died in the war and he sees the picture, Guess what? By huge coincidence, it looks like her father was also his father, and they may be brother and sister. Even he himself says it's kind of like a bad melodrama. Frustrated by this, they try to figure out what they're supposed to do while interacting with all sorts of goofy characters and learning life lessons and interacting with adults who are sometimes right, sometimes wrong, while constantly hearing that goofy music that just celebrates a time of being young. Yeah, it sounds pretty standard and done a million times, and in many respects, it kind of is. I was kind of rolling my eyes that these are the turns that this story is taking, but at the same time, I did find myself kind of wrapped up in it. I think a lot of that comes from not only the pacing and the animation style, which is beautiful to look at, but also some really damn good voice acting. I mean, the voice acting in the American dubs of the Ghibli films have usually been spectacular, and Disney's done a wonderful job. But this one especially seems good because, unlike the other Ghibli films, there's not a lot of supernatural elements, or magical scenes, or weird angles, or anything like that. It's just sort of straightforward what you see is what you get. Therefore, the performances have to be good, or it's gonna lose you very quickly. 
I'm really amazed at not only how well they match the lip movements, but how they keep the emotion of the characters totally intact while doing so. Everybody has a slip up here or there, even the best actors. But this one seems really on track and seems to hit everything pitch perfect. Another strong point is its side stories, which again are a little cliched, but so much time is dedicated to them, I do find myself actually getting pretty wrapped up in them. For example, there's a building that holds a bunch of school clubs that's going to be torn down. All the students inside, most of them boys, are pissed off and constantly fighting to keep it around. However, with the help of our main character and her friends, they show that a big part is the appearance, and that if they clean it up, get it looking nice, and stop being awkward social shut-ins, maybe they'll have a better chance to save it. At first I was kind of annoyed at what cutouts a lot of these boys seemed like, just the traditional nerds that said traditional nerdy things. But after a while, I really didn't want to see that place go. I really found myself liking it. I even grew accustomed to some of these oddballs, even if they were kind of cliched. So on the one hand, yeah, it is kind of a story that's been done a million times. The coming of age story that's in the 60s and kind of American graffiti-ish meets Animal House-ish meets, I don't know, just a million other movies you've seen before. But I think with a visual touch, some really good acting, and some really decent pacing and atmosphere, it actually comes out okay. Can you feel the manipulation when it's going on? Absolutely. But you can also kind of feel the charm of it too, slowly over time. I do still see a lot of major problems with it, especially with the music that seems constantly on all the time. But even that starts to die down after a while, and you start to hear these people for what they're really saying. And maybe you start to see the movie for what it's really doing. Be a charming little film that may have been done a million times before, but maybe isn't trying to do anything that new. Just try to do it in a way that's standard, but charming. At least, charming enough. I'd say you probably have to be pretty forgiving in order to really get into this film, but if you lower down your defenses a little bit, it isn't half bad. Not a great experience, but not a harsh one either. If you're looking for a romance that's standard, but pleasant, this isn't a bad one to check out. Let's finish off Disney December with The Wind Rises, Miyazaki's final film. Which, yeah, he said that a couple times before, but hey, who am I to complain if he wants to make more movies? They're always great! As far as I know, this is the first time he's actually taken on a true story. The film centers around the life of a designer who created the Japanese World War II fighting planes. Many, many people would see this as a bad person, but the film makes it very clear that all he wants to do is be innovative and push the boundaries of what can be done with technology. It's shown very clearly that even from his youth, all he's ever wanted to do was push the envelope. And the film, rather than focus on the controversies of what it led to, though don't get me wrong, it's not entirely ignored either, focuses instead on the innovation and the imagination to bring these incredible wonders to life. In some respects, it's the most downplayed out of the Miyazaki films. I mean, there's not really any monsters or moving castles or anything like that. But he still finds a way to incorporate so much beauty and so much artistry into it. For example, he constantly gets visits in his dreams from his heroes, great inventors and creators who are constantly encouraging him to try and find a way to make himself even better. He also comes across a lot of places that happen to look beautiful, and even survives an earthquake that, as you imagine being a Miyazaki film, is pretty incredible to watch. Again, one of the charms of Miyazaki is that you can be technically not watching much, just a guy working on a plane or talking about ideas or working with other people, but there's such a likable ambition and atmosphere and environment to all of it. You want to get to know these people, you want to help them with their planes. And knowing Miyazaki's love for gears and gadgets, this film has all sorts of that. Creating, building, failing, trying again. And you really admire this guy for having a dream, trying his damnedest to follow it all the way through, even if in the end it would amount to something horrible. As I said before, the film doesn't ignore the fact that this resulted in the deaths of so many people. There's definitely people dropping hints about the Nazi party and what he's getting involved in, and all the way through it, he doesn't know what to do, he just wants to create, he wants to be the inventor. I suppose a lot of people could look at him as a bad person for this, but it's also kind of like Einstein. Here's a guy who created the atomic bomb, one of the greatest destroyers of human life, yet we still see him as a genius. And there's definitely people that don't like him too because of that. But there's no denying that there's still a brilliant mind at work that used a lot of creativity, imagination, and determination to do what they thought was going to be a great thing. And I think that's the best thing to admire about this film. The ambition. The ambition of the main character, the ambition of him trying to get his ideas done, and trying to do what he loves to do. 
There's a wonderful final image where he's discussing with one of his masters what he's done and what he's created. It's a beautiful yet haunting landscape of a bunch of people dead and planes destroyed, yet it's in this beautiful green field of imagination and possibility. It's such a weird mix. But it's also the perfect bittersweet sum up to everything this guy was working for. The problems I have with the film are very minor. For example, the romance in the film, though I don't know the real story about it, seems a touch forced. He meets this woman by accident during an earthquake, and then years later they happen to stumble across each other again, and even without knowing each other very well, they decide to suddenly get married. It's almost something like out of a 40s Disney fairy tale. Again, I don't know if that was intentional or if it was a cultural thing, but it was definitely a little odd. It's not that they have no chemistry, but for a film we know is supposed to be based on real life, it's a touch distracting. I also start to notice things that I guess I never really picked up from Miyazaki before that are also a little weird. Like he never really does sweating or crying correctly, it always kind of looks like they have some sort of sickness. Plus, I know this guy is trying to be helpful and everything, but he scares the shit out of me. Something about those eyes, they just don't look right, it looks like some sort of weird demon, I don't know, could they have fixed that up or something? But aside from that, this film is very obviously a romanticized version of true life events. Yeah, a lot of it technically happened, but it's pretty clear there was a lot of creative liberties. But never to a point where it's insulting. It's kind of like Tombstone, they got the basic story and people down. But yeah, they obviously changed stuff up to make it flow a little nicer and be a little bit more epic, and you can usually tell when those moments are. I think what impressed me most though is only in the last 10 minutes was I starting to get a little tired and saying to myself, oh, I wonder how long this movie is, but then when I checked out and saw it was 126 minutes, I couldn't believe it. Only in the last few did I realize how long it was and through the rest of it I was just enjoying it so much. I can't believe a biography about a guy making planes had me so invested and so drawn in that I was actually willing to sit there for 126 minutes without even realizing I was sitting there for that long. If this did turn out to be Miyazaki's last film, it would definitely be a good one to go out on. It's very clear he has this incredible respect for someone that just wants to follow his dreams and do something incredible. Failing time after time, but still getting right back up to try again. Much like Miyazaki, it's a guy who loves his work and loves doing beyond what he thought he was capable of. Definitely might push some people's sensibilities the wrong way, but I think the focus of the film was to look at the power of imagination, and perseverance, and hard work, and dedicating yourself to never giving up and doing something incredible. And I can say that's definitely what I've gotten out of the Studio Ghibli films. A world of imagination, entertainment, and so much hard work that went into it. So many of these films are classics in a lot of people's eyes, and they deserve to be classics in even more people's eyes. People this dedicated, hardworking, and are able to get their ideas to the big screen should be celebrated as much as possible. So thank you so much for joining me in this disney December. Like I said before, there are a couple popular demands I'll throw in in January, but for the most part I want to say thanks to you guys for always making this such a fun experience to put these together, share my opinions, share yours as well, and keep talking about great artwork that comes from great people. Keep alive those great ideas, determination, artistry, and always allow great imagination to take flight.